Okay, this is December 16th, 2015. Meeting of the Oyster River Cooperative School Board will come to order. December 16th being Maria Barr's birthday. We'd like to begin by wishing you a happy birthday, Maria. Well, thank you. <laughs> I thought that's what everybody was here for. <laughs> yeah, I knew that's what the audience was for, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Um, so we'll begin with public comment. Hi, how are you? Okay. Um, I wrote my remarks down, which I don't usually do. So my name is Erin Sharp, and I have um, done pres presentations both to um, the school board, to the community, and also to all of the teachers and staff in Oyster River about school start times. And I just wanted to come today um, both as a parent, so I have a sixth grader and a second grader um, in Oyster River, and also I'm a faculty member in the Department of Human Development and Family Studies and Adolescent Development as my area of um, expertise. And I just wanted to um, thank the district for taking on the school tart start time issue, and um, I wanted to just reiterate my support for Oyster River delaying the school start time for the middle school and high school. And just to remind um, the board of the research on this topic and that, um, you know, it's probably one of the only educational policies that has just um, consistently positive support behind it. The research is clear, the research is mounting, um, and you know it's one of those few opportunities where we, we really have enough evidence to know that positive benefits would occur from delaying the school start times. Um, I also just wanted to say that uh, I think it's important to mention that this is not a personal issue for me. I come at it professionally and from the, the research and the literature. Um, I have talked to families in the community and change is really challenging and changing schedules is challenging. And um, unless school becomes full day, families are gonna have to juggle um, either morning issues or afternoon issues for all of their children. Right now, my elementary second grader gets on the bus pretty late, so we have to go to work. You know, we have to balance that to go to work late. My middle schooler gets home super early, and we've unfortunately had to leave him at home unsupervised this year because of our schedules. So any schedule is, is gonna cause some, sh some shifting of families. Um, and so I just want us to be careful as we move forward as a district, not to kind of go down that rabbit hole because there um, is, more and more communities across the nation have changed their school start times. You see it in the news um, almost monthly now, a large district, the latest was Seattle's public school district, has come out with changing their school start times. And we just have so much evidence that all the same concerns exist Every single school that has done this and every single school that has done this has come out afterwards and said, um, we, you know, we would never change back. So yes, it will be a, a, a time of, um, you know, change is hard, but we know that it's gonna be moving our district in the right direction. So thank you. Thank you, Erin. Other comment? Hearing none, okay. Um, we have a, a motion to approve the December 2nd, 2015 regular minutes. No? I'll make a motion to approve the December 2nd regular minutes. Moved by Al, is there a second? Seconded by Denise, are there corrections to those minutes? Is this a Christmas present? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm hearing no corrections, is that? Okay. Uh, could we have a vote? All those in favor of approving the regular minutes, please raise your hand. Seven in favor, student rep in favor. Could I have a motion to approve the non-public <coughs> minutes of that meeting? Kenny? I move that we accept the non-public minutes from that meeting. Moved by Kenny, is there a second? Seconded by Denise. <coughs> Corrections? Sarah? <laughs> When it's, it discusses Jim as the administrator being present. We don't ever talk about when Jim left, and Jim was not present uh, for the entire meeting. The board was just the board for a substantial part of that. So I don't know if we can correct that. I don't know if we have a time for when Jim left. Yeah, couldn't have been more than 10 minutes. From so the, the meeting, started. when did the meeting start? Is that on the minutes? It should be in the motion. 
Or the top. Yeah, it's back, I think, in the regular minutes. Regular. At 859, we went into we went into non-public at 1003. So I'll just, uh, Wait, I'll add to the minute that I've left at 910. Yeah. 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 Okay. With that addition, uh, any other changes? Hearing none, all those in favor of approving the non-public minutes with that addition, please raise your hands. Seven in favor. Motion passes. Uh, announcements and accommodations from the district. Uh, none. Okay. Uh, announcements and accommodations from the board. Denise? Sorry, I was jumping ahead. I was messing with my iPad. Um, <laughs> yes, I actually do have a um, comment. Um, I would like to comment on the internet safety presentation that was held um, on Monday the 7th at the middle school. Um, it was sponsored by the PTO. And I've got to say that when I heard the presentation was on internet safety, I thought, mm, yeah, I know about that. Well, I definitely learned a few things. Um, during that presentation, uh, Detective Fleming from, he's, he works, I believe, in the Salem uh, Police Department, but he's also with the Crimes Against Children Unit, um, and he, he presented, and uh, two things that really stood out for me, first of all, was the level of sophistication of predators today was, it was really scary. Um, it's way beyond just like, don't tell, you know, your children shouldn't talk to strangers online. I mean, it was just, well, gee, what about, you know, uh, putting your name in for a contest to get free concert tickets or, you know, just really the, the, the way that they um, entrap kids, you know, to um, give out personal information. Um, and the second thing that, and this actually pertains to our topic about start times tonight in a way, is that um, he stated that the hours between um, 11 p.m. and 2 a.m. are the most dangerous times. And the reason for that is that parents go to bed, but the kids, as we know, because of their biological clocks and they're not sleepy, so what are they doing instead of sleeping? Um, they're online um, and they're on social media and the predators know that and they're online also. Um, so I just really want to encourage folks that have um, teens and you know, pass this on to your friends. It was um, recorded and it is going to be shown on DCAT so um, people will have the opportunity to see that presentation. It was about an hour long, and uh, like I say, believe me, I, you know, I was very shocked with some of the information that he shared, and I think it's just so important. So I, I hope that people will check that out. Thank you, Denise. Other, Kenny? I just want to remind and point out to the community that this Saturday, um, the 19th, there'll be a, a gathering to kind of remember Martin Brewer. It's at the Durham Evangelical Church. And Todd, the time is at what o'clock? And um, everyone is invited in the community to, to honor this wonderful educator. I'm sorry, what time was it? One o'clock on Saturday. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Others, Sarah? Um, I just want to uh, acknowledge and appreciate the music staff at the schools. Uh, I have been to a number of musical events lately uh, and have just been wowed at everyone. Some, some, wonderful, uh, some wonderful new, hopefully, traditions were started. Um, and I want to thank not only the music staff, but also the support of the teaching staff. I know I was just at a Masked Way second grade production, and all of the second grade team was there helping with the kids. Um, and I, I know the middle school had the same kind of experience where there were middle school teachers there, and I'm sure at every level that has happened. So um, thank you also to all the staff supporting the music staff. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, others? Okay, um, I don't know if there's an assistant superintendent's report. I assume not, is that correct? Um, superintendent's report? Just a couple of things. Um, <coughs> Tom asked me to take the Smarter Balance um, scores and transmit it into an article for the e-crier and for the Friday update, and that's been done and it's in your packet. 
And Tom asked me to do this exercise of the top 10 things that we learned from smart, uh, administering Smarter Balance for the first time. And so rather than my doing it unilaterally, I had an administrative meeting yesterday and I asked each administrator to offer one thought related to the Smarter Balance. Uh, the first one was choosing as late in the year as possible provides maximum learning time for our students. So last year we all chose as late as possible because it was a new assessment and we were anxious about it. But the feedback from some of the staff at least is that was a good choice and something that we should want, want to consider continuing. Um, Smarter balance assessment is definitely more challenging than the previous statewide uh, test, NECAP. When the administrative team looked at the third grade questions last year, we were just like aghast that our kids would um, have to answer such sophisticated questions and the kids did really well. So I guess we were worried for not. Students are far more resilient than adults give them credit for. Uh, our investment in technology resulted in no technology breakdowns for the district, not true for the state. Um, they did have one day that it crashed, but it wasn't our, our issue. Smarter Balance offered more value for the individual student. Student, school, and district results were impressive. Um, number seven is we may have spent more time than necessary preparing. As you may recall, and Kenny brought it up a, a number of times, we actually prepared for the new Smarter Balance Assessment from October through its administration. And this year, we have not talked about it once. So the investment, I think, was worthwhile, but I think probably we did overkill. The high school did well, even though so many of our students opted out. About 40% of the high school kids did not take the Smarter Balanced Assessment. Math still is an area of growth for the district, especially at the high school. And the ten, number 10 reason uh, observation from Smarter Balance is our teachers are still the best resource for individual student growth as they have a comprehensive understanding of individual students in their classroom. So good list. Yeah. Thank you, Tom. And just my own observation from looking over the scores, and, I, and I'm certainly not a huge advocate of standardized tests. But uh, I was concerned about the cutoff point. I brought that up a couple times because the cutoff point for the country was set at about 40% proficiency. It was set so that that would be pretty much the target. And the state of New Hampshire typically does much better than, than the, the country as a whole. And so that state of New Hampshire, which is typically about the third or fourth performing state in the union, set at 50, it performed at 50%, and we were pretty much at 70%. So I think it was a uh, a gratifying result from the latest results that I don't have data for but the commissioner reported out last week at the superintendent's meeting is New Hampshire may have been the number one performing state on smarter balance in, the, in all of the states that take it so it'd be like 18 states mm -hmm. and we're 20 essentially 20 percent higher than the, than the state average thank you yeah other yeah okay great um, business administrator um, just giving you a December 8th budget update. Uh, everything looks, on, it's on target. The salaries are a little higher with the amount remaining just because we, we have the assistant superintendent position still open. We've got to refill all of the slots, so that's going to change a little, but it's looking good. Mm -hmm. Great. That's Great. it on that. Do you have a question, Kenny? Just a question, just kind of looking at. Um, the way we have the budgeted and expended and encumbrances, mm -hmm. which is what we've committed to spend. And understanding the issue with our not being able to fully staff our transportation department, do you anticipate that we're going to wind up having unexpended money in that transportation department because that, of that? That's a tough one because we... <coughs> Typically with encumbrances, we have contracts for people, so those amounts are set. With the drivers, it's, it's a, an estimate. So we have in the past had monies, funds in there, and it's hard to say, but that's a, that's a gamble. We, we probably will, Kenny, but that at the amount we encumbered is an estimate. So depending on some of the things that vary, our sports teams, if they go into tournaments, they may travel farther, they may travel more. So those things we don't encumber, so that's where that number will vary slightly. Does that make sense? Yep, it does. And, and, and I raised it in that our efforts to 
really be very concerned about our overall spending and the impact on the community. One of our areas where we made a further cut was transportation. And so uh, I'm just maybe pointing that out in mind, and maybe if we do have this reserve right. in transportation, maybe we can restore mm -hmm. some of that money to the department and kind of continue along that track that we had hoped. And I don't, I, mm -hmm. I think when the time comes, we can look at that, but, mm -hmm. but perhaps maybe there is that opportunity. Mm -hmm. I'm not quite following your observation, Kenny. So you're saying if there's a balance in transportation, do what? But so for our upcoming budget, I know. Yeah, our upcoming budget. We, we were planning to, um, in order to try to bring the budget more in line, but even further than really our budget goals were, we did make some cuts in transportation, further cuts. And if there oh, right. a way to We cut a bus. We cut a bus, yeah. Right, in a way to be able to use, if there's some unexpended money that was designated transportation this year, to be able to utilize that in the following year. Gotcha. Okay. I'll set with that. Other, Other questions, questions about the uh, budget update? Okay, the default budget? Default. Uh, I don't think you had this format last year. This is a new format. I think it was on a different, but this is the one that's online, the one that we're using now. Um, it's basically the same. We have each category from last year, and then we pull over this year's. Any changes? Um, if you look, for instance, on page one, you can see our current year adopted budget increases. In most cases, they're all increases. Those are salary and benefits that are um, negotiated union contracts. Those are part of default. Um, the only decrease I think you'll see on there is for the bond, because the interest goes down every year. And overall, the difference between the budget that you have out there now and the default budget is fifty-seven thousand six hundred and thirty-four dollars. Not a lot. Can you say that? Again? Can you say that one number? Fifty-seven six thirty-four. So the default budget is virtually the same as the much. proposed budget. Pretty much. But remember, okay. we didn't put anything new in there. We held the line, and it's all obligations to contracts for the most part, and health insurance at sixteen point eight percent. Questions on that form? Just want to bring home that point that a default budget is uh, you you minus out those issues that are new um, issues. So last year default budget would have been several hundred thousand dollars less, but because of how we built the budget based on um, approved contracts, health insurance increases, that's what's really driven our budget increase. So there isn't those items that we typically see to cut out of the budget. And so we will need you to sign that form. We'll probably bring it back to the next meeting because you'll need it for your public hearing. So I just wanted to give you an opportunity to have it and any other questions, bring it back at the next meeting. Any <coughs> questions about the default budget? No, hearing none, thank you very thank you. much. Um, Dr. Morris has suggested that we change the order of the, um, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Student Center Report. Sorry, Carol. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Um, the Student Senate met this morning and we discussed on our planning of our winter carnival that we're hoping to have in February <laughs> and we're working on different events and creating a more detailed schedule to present to the administration. Have you reached out to the to this, um, ski areas to see if you can borrow a snow making machine? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, Sorry, Dr. Morris had suggested we, we change the order of the next two topics um, since there's a group of kindergarten teachers here to talk about the update. And sure. I don't think that'll be too lengthy. No, I, I, the, <laughs> the reason I asked that the kindergarten piece come first. That's is, all right. Is that, are people agreeable to that? Mm -hmm. yeah. I'd invite Deb and Michelle and, and um, Dennis up to the podium. <coughs> the reason I asked for it to go first is um, this is part of the budget and uh, you asked us to address specific questions, and we're going to do that for you. So I need to get up to that podium. Okay. Wrong one's up. Hey, Gabby. I'll let him do it. Don't forget still. 
So in your packets uh, are the list of questions that you wanted to address. And what we've done is we've turned it into a PowerPoint so that the viewing audience can see um, our responses to those as well. So all of the kindergarten teachers, um, Deb and Michelle are here tonight to represent all of them. Uh, Dennis and Carrie and I have met really over the course of two years now to prepare for th this budget. Um, we're very excited that the board has made this its number one goal for the budget. And we also just want to remind everybody that the way that we're paying for full day kindergarten is by eliminating the kindergarten run in the middle of the day, which captures about $140,000, and by utilizing two teachers at the elementary level who um, we can reassign to this work. So by doing that, we capture the money that we need in order to implement full day kindergarten without adding new dollars to the budget. So obviously, the first question would be, are we going to be offering this? You've made it crystal clear as a school board that we are. And in the course of talking about full day kindergarten, the teachers have talked about, um, well, what if? And the big question was, what if a parent doesn't want this? <coughs> Now, the really super thing about our kindergarten teachers is over the past month, they've actually been visiting um, other schools. They've visited Newmarket, they've visited York, they've visited, um, what was the other one up, uh, Rochester. And what they've learned is what we've, what we've been predicting, that there are parents who opt out of full day kindergarten. It's a very, very small number. And by the time you hit Thanksgiving or Christmas, that small number has become either zero or an even smaller number. Um, they were able to validate that in their conversations with teachers across the area. So for a parent who doesn't want full day, we're not going to force full day on anyone. Parent can opt out and what would happen is um, because we can't predict where art, music, phys ed uh, happen in the school day because as Dennis and Carrie schedule a school day, um, they have to be thinking about all the grades in their building. Um, it's a parent's decision. We would support that decision, but we can't predict what the child would lose as a result of that decision. So there's you know, some ambiguity as far as would they lose specials, would they lose math time, would they, it's probably unlikely they would use, lose literacy because teachers tend to do literacy in the morning schedule. So. That's the answer that we have for this particular question. And again, I think what I'll do, since these are your questions, do you want any additional information? The teachers are willing, Dennis is willing. Does this satisfy what, what you're looking for? Okay. Yeah. Um, you uh, asked about lunch. It's interesting. <laughs> we asked about lunch, and we've had many conversations around lunchtime. Um, but what we did, again, is learn from these experiences, is, uh, visits that the teachers did was, it seems like every school they visited has a dedicated K lunchtime. Um, again, it would be up to Dennis and Carrie to figure out where in the day that would happen because both buildings don't follow exactly the same pattern. And so they would, optim they would optimally work with their kindergarten teachers to try to make that happen in a way that um, supports the age of the five-year-old. Uh, they visited some schools where it was happening at 11 o'clock, 11.05, and other schools where it was happening a little bit later. It really would depend on what the kindergarten teachers wanted in each building, and it would be up to Dennis and Carrie to figure out how to make that happen. Okay. Um, you made it crystal clear last year that we're going to hold to class size. Uh, we have 54 slots at both buildings. So in an ideal world, we'd have 108 kindergarten kids show up and we'd have space for all of them. But we also are concerned that um, a child would come in later in the registration process and start throwing the class sizes <coughs> higher than 18. And in our last budget discussion, uh, you have built in a contingency in the proposed budget that would allow for a seventh class to be created if necessary. The issue there is that seventh class would have to be at Massway because it's the only school that has space. So if the 54 is exceeded by Lee students, it's not an issue. It only becomes an issue if the 54 is exceeded and they would normally go to a Mahermet, they would have to go 
to Mass Way. Yes, Sarah. Um, if when this is this slideshow going to be presented to the community? Is that absolutely. This will be part of the forum we're okay. going to do on January twelfth. Um, I guess I am uncomfortable with the yes, the recommendation for kindergarten class size is set at eighteen because that's our maximum. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that to me, I read that and I go, an ideal kindergarten is eighteen, no. which I don't think any of us would right. say. I would say the maximum we will go is eighteen. Okay, we can adjust that slide, it's no a problem. Tweak, but yeah, but good thank you, and the, and that comes under the heading of being critical friends. If you see how we put things together and you want to input, this would be the time to do it. I'm sure the teachers are relieved to hear you say that. <laughs> actually, I... Denise? I actually, maybe keeping both were the recommendation for the maximum kindergarten class, because I'm thinking if a, if a child moves to the district in October and puts a class at 19, we're not gonna set up a whole new, you know, seventh right. section in October, you know what I'm saying? So I guess, you know, the recommendation for the maximum kindergarten class size, mm -hmm. maybe? And the, the recommendation is right out of the verbiage of our policy, right. so we can, yeah. policy. we can capture it both, yeah. Yeah. capture the policy language. Um, the board has asked us whether we would be doing an early registration this year. Uh, the teachers and the two principals are absolutely on board with that. They want to do the registration March 7th through the 11th inclusive of one of those days being an evening registration um, uh, slot so that parents who are working can come in in an evening slot and get their child registered. Uh, when we talked about this, um, we just think it's really important to get the word out. Uh, Dennis did a great job reaching out to the Oyster River parents of preschoolers, uh, so much so that they're gonna offer childcare on, the, on January 12th so we are definitely getting the word out. The area providers are, are knowing about it. We're going to use the school messenger to, when we come right back from the holiday to start dumping emails into our, our parent population. So if anybody knows of anybody who would be entering kindergarten this year, they know uh, that March 7th to 11th is an important week for registration, especially uh, to try to stay into that that uh, number of 54, and so after that, then that starts driving the issue of whether we have a seventh class or not. Um, you know, I, this question came with all best intentions as far as making sure our teachers had everything they needed. Our teachers are veteran staff members. The staff visits that they'll be going to the, the area schools have been really great conversations among, uh, caused really great conversations among them. Um, they've picked up some things and rejected totally other things. Uh, so it's, it's a, been a great, that's, that's the level of commitment that our staff has had in terms of making sure they're ready. In terms of any professional training, they're not necessarily looking for that. I think they're just looking for our support. Could I just ask a question there? I mean, you sure what can. was the most interesting thing? This is the teacher. What was the most interesting thing you learned from visiting these other schools? Uh, you could, Deb. Deb? <laughs> uh, the school that I visited was in York, and they do a wonderful job with the literacy, and I was, it was interesting to watch them teach math using a different program than we do. Um, but the, they are really packing it in. And even when they got a full day, they still felt that they couldn't always have enough play time. And I just feel really lucky that we have administrators that back up that, yes, we have more to do, but free play, independent play, sometimes structured play is still a very important part. And they're not always getting that in in other districts. Here, here. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure. Um, I actually had the same experience, and I, when we walked out of the class that we visited, my first thought was that uh, they've just moved uh, first grade down into kindergarten. Those kids came in at 8.30 in the morning, had a snack, and they had a seven minute break until 11 o'clock when they worked straight through, all sitting at tables or in reading groups, and I just, it left a, a bad taste in my mouth. I don't want to do that to our kids. I feel that at this point, we struggle to get out to play. We struggle to have story time. And I just want to be able to do those things 
And I was just um, speaking earlier about an article I just read about stress with our younger generation. It starts at elementary school, we see it, and it only is exacerbated as the kids get into high school. And one of the first things it talked about in this article was so much is being pushed down lower and lower on our kids and we're stressing them out. They're just not having time to play. So that's how I felt. Thank you. So that actually leads into what we perceive as a sample full day schedule. Uh, again, with six teachers, you're going to have variations on the theme and with two different schoolhouses, you're going to have different pressures. So rather than try to be definitive and say this is the kindergarten schedule, what we want to do is provide you a template for what a schedule could look like, leaving Deb's schedule to Deb and Michelle's schedule to Michelle. But here are the things that we know are important. We know that literacy is critical, and we know that our commitment as a district is 60 to 90 minutes. Now, having just heard Michelle, we don't want you to leave here thinking that our kids are sitting <coughs> for 60 to 90 minutes e exhaustively doing literacy. They're very talented educators and they break the literacy up into 15 minute blocks, 20 minute blocks, reading. It's a, it's a much more engaging uh, process than what would appear when you say 60 to 90 minutes. But we also know the research says 60 to 90 minutes of literacy is a critical foundation for students learning to read and, and write. The other aspect of our schedule that we're committed to is 45 to 60 minutes of math. Now that could happen through games, it could happen through lessons. It's not, again, we're gonna set our kids down in a seat for 45 to 60 minutes and say, we're gonna teach them math. Uh, the teachers would use their skills in terms of making sure those lessons were interested in, in much smaller increments. Uh, science and social studies at the primary level tends to be an integrated subject. They use them to excite kids. That would happen in our uh, full day program. Lunch and recess are important socialization times. It's about not just eating, but it's about learning how to eat in groups. It's about being able to converse quietly. It's about engaging each other in conversation. And then we would want all of our kindergarten kids to have specials, art, music, phys ed, and library. And then another important component for our teachers is helping children make good choices. And they help them make good choices by creating engaging centers where the youngsters make choices or, in some cases, are chosen for them, depending on their skill set and maturity. So what we are trying to say here is these are the important components that our kindergarten teachers would use. But to re-emphasize what Michelle said, we also believe that play and free play and structured play are an important part of a five-year-old's program, and that would be embedded through all of this. Questions for the teachers? Um, just about the specials, I, I was trying to recall, do, do kindergartners currently have specials? And so they're sort of the sections are already built into, because I was all of a sudden thinking that's a lot of extra sections to add, but it's not really adding a lot of, you know, they're already getting those specials. In that's other right. Words. Yeah. And that, because at our school, um, we have three sessions, you have four sessions of kindergarten, so there's already, those are already built in the schedule, so it's yeah. not a okay. change. Got it. Thank you. And that's times two, because it's a morning session and an afternoon session, so this actually could make a more sane oh. Uh, pro, uh, approach for our art teachers, phys ed teachers, and music teachers. Okay. Kenny? Maybe, uh, go, uh, okay. go ahead. I, I had a few things, so maybe I'll go down them one by one. Um, with the first thing about how we're having the opt-out for parents who don't want to participate in the full day, um, just two things that came to mind. One, will we be able to provide parents who are doing that opt-out kind of a, a, a syllabus or something of the equivalent if they want to engage with that, um, with their kids at home. So just thinking maybe yeah, We began be to have that conversation a little bit. We have a lot of resources online uh, with Eureka, the new math program, and I know that we have a lot of resources that we can point to, uh, parents toward in terms of uh, uh, literacy as well. 
but one of the things we can't do, Kenny, just because of capacity, is we couldn't customize a lesson. I mean, Deb wouldn't have the physical time in a day to customize a lesson, but we certainly can provide them with resources. Okay, and, that, and I think that, yeah. and, and the other part of that, are we going to be accepting or tolerant of, let's say, a particular family that wants their kid, let's say, just um, opting out of afternoons, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, but coming afternoons, just Tuesdays, and Thursdays. <laughs> I, I'm just... No, I I'm think just, it's I, a good question because, yeah. it's, you know, every iteration uh, that you could think of is probably something that could happen. Right. Of course. Um, you know, if a child wants to be full day on Tuesdays and Thursdays and the parent wants to be on half days on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, it's fine by us. We're going we're gonna to be working toward the, uh, making the environment so rich for the children that the parent wants their child to be there Monday through Friday. Okay. I think initially there's going to be a few that don't want to do that, but as I said, my experience in 40 years and the observations that the teachers made in these last couple, three weeks, is it doesn't last long. Parents want the program once they know it's available. And my next thing is more of a comment, and, and then I do have some questions, but uh, as a board member, I feel it far from my role or responsibility to talk about curriculum, really, um, at that level. But I just wanted to say personally how refreshing it was to hear how we want to build in that playtime. We don't want all that time to be structured, you know, with a book in front of them. And, and that's not my role, and I don't mean to step over, out of that role, but it, that meant well, a lot to Well, you'd be encouraged to know all six kindergarten, all, all the teachers that we currently have teaching garden, 100% behind that, Ken. Okay. Really want the experience to be a rich experience, not just an academic experience. And then um, two more. One, do we anticipate having full day, K, is that going to then change curriculum for first grade? Do we see that that this is going to be a moving um, kind of surge? I, I would say that, that ultimately it will have an impact on first grade and the other primary grades over time, just like uh, we expect the current math program to have an impact on grades six, seven, and eight as the, the first grade or as the kindergarten teachers are moving forward uh, their children into first grade, they're just going to be more capable students because they've had more time with the kindergarten. And then the last thing, and, um, and it's talking about the school assignment. And we have the week of registration. And if, let's say, neither school fills that first week of registration and then kids come in after that registration, I, I think I understand them being assigned to the school maybe where, where there is that room. But thinking if, let's say, a school gets over-enrolled in that first week and the two conceivable situations is um, Massway comes in with more than 54 but there's room at Moharamit or let's say Moharamit overshoots that 54 and we need to think of a class, do we have a methodology to, is it going to be just first come first serve within that week and then? Yeah, we've, we've talked about that at length and um, ultimately uh, it can get, you can create a very convoluted process and I think the, the, the best process is as simple as we can make it, which is uh, a first come first serve process and then when the slots are full, the assignment switches to the other building. You know, we, we, we tried in various conversations to think of something that would work, that would be as fair and clear to incoming parents, and really, that's about as clear as you can get, you know, and that's why we want to encourage that March 7th to 11th registration. And, and, and again, I defer to you all, but I think this is some, I think this is the area that probably will produce the most angst in mm -hmm. parents who are enrolling. So as clear as we can be about that and as wide as we can distribute that. I and we do anticipate that being a one-year problem because right. we do anticipate that Moharamit will have the space in the following year to keep Moharamit children and Massway will, of course, so, already yeah. has the space. So maybe we can work on that particular slide so it's just really crystal clear. We'll do. How that, how that yep. works. Good.
Good. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so I just want to, my comment was that in my mind when we were moving to full and it was comforting to hear teachers observations of seeing other schools because I think it's kind of a mistake where people are trying to do like an accelerated kindergarten. But in my mind moving to the full day K part of it was because the half day K kind of felt packed and we were gaining some time and flexibility so that you were moving away from that packed feeling and ironically people are seeing that extra time is a way to cram more in it and just extend that for the full day. And it's really good to hear. I mean, time is our valued commodity and giving you guys some flexibility is what I thought this was about. So it's good to hear that that's what we're doing. Well, I think that's a, a good example of uh, administration working with staff because the kindergarten teachers were, were the experts in the room about how to structure a day that would be the most effective for students. And Dennis and I are there to really support their um, direction. And you know everything in the research about full day K is supportive of the experience, but also um, when you read into the research, uh, it's also supportive of making sure it doesn't become first grade. You know, it's, we're not trying to create first grade a year early. And just so the board knows, um, this work is on the website. We'll take it down and make some modifications that were suggested by the board this evening and we'll put it back up. We'll put up the registration dates and um, I, I think we'll have a great forum on January 2012. Uh, I believe parents will show up and we'll make sure they uh, are well aware and um, we're ready to go in the fall. Sarah? And I just want to go back to something that you actually said when you were talking about the um, smarter balance piece and when you were going through your top 10 list that students are more resilient than we often give them credit for. And I think that when I, when I think about the um, potential stress of not knowing where your kid is going to go to kindergarten, I always think that as long as you, you sort of paint the picture of where, you know, you're going here, and of course there are kids that are in different circumstances and need to know months in advance because that's who that kid is. But I think it, it, it really it falls a lot on the parents to sort of say, you know, we're not sure yet, but it's gonna be a great place regardless of where you're gonna go and let's check these two places out and let's, you know, and so I think for any of those cusp families that are, it's a little unknown as to where the chips are gonna fall, you know, it, it's, it is going to fall a little bit on the parents to be like, okay, well, let's go check out Massway. Let's go check out Moharamit. We don't know where we're going to go yet, but wow, look at these two great places. And that kids, given that support, can be incredibly resilient. I couldn't agree with you more, Sarah. We have two excellent elementary schools. <coughs> Even if you just judge them by the academic performance on Smarter Balance, you'd see that they're equivalent schools. But if you, like me or Dennis or Deb and Michelle, go into these schools, they just feel like great places for kids to be. So if you're the 55th child and you end up in the school that you weren't expecting to end up in, it's still going to be a marvelous experience. No question about it. Okay. Do you want to continue then? Um, so we talked about the cost is reallocation from the uh, transportation account because we won't need 14 buses moving through the district at noontime. And that's a shift of about $140,000. And then we have uh, two classroom teachers that can be reassigned uh, to this endeavor. And so there's no additional staff costs. Uh, we talked about this a little bit already in terms of um, you know, the number of seats we have available. And that will be crystal clear. That's the number of seats we have available. And that we're doing the registration from March 7th to 11th. I keep on saying that because it's the repeat, repeat and repeat again, March. <laughs> is going to be our registration week. And um, to be counted as registered, we talked about this at length as well. Um, <laughs> at one point we're thinking, hey, this is an opportune time to get all the data that we chase after for six months, health records and birth certificates and so forth, but to be officially registered minimally, they're gonna have to show up with that birth certificate and they're going to have to show up with their proof of residency. Then we'll continue to chase after the health and records and so <laughs> forth. But when we talked about it, we realized that parents aren't in control of those health records, doctors are. And you know, doctors will say, yeah, I'll send that out tomorrow, and it might be two weeks later. So we felt um, that the piece you, the parents <laughs> could... <laughs> 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 
<laughs> some doctors kidding, uh, who are very, very busy. So we're um, we're saying <laughs> so we're saying that um, those two pieces give us the you have your slot with those two pieces, and. Um, so this is another big issue that we talked about. When would parents be informed of who they have as a teacher? Our current practice is August. Mm -hmm. Our teachers want to keep it yeah. at August. Uh, largely because they end school, they're taking care of their records, and July really becomes kind of a sacred month for them. And if we move it forward in time, even though we did the registration early, they're concerned that they get lots of phone calls, lots of visits so forth and that our tradition has been August and we want to maintain August as the who do you have as a teacher. And when will they be notified of their school placement? Immediately? After that, they register? I mean, yeah, I mean it depends on what happens in March, but it, clearly if we're, you know, under the 54 in both schools, they'll know immediately. It'll be when we get into that tricky spot of the 55th student in either of the schools, then we will be in a position. Of course, as we said, Mass Day wouldn't be the issue. If you're the 55th student at Massway, you're still at Massway. It only becomes an issue if you're the 55th student at Mohiramet. Okay, and there's what we're hoping will happen. Next conversation will be with incoming parents. We hope that we get lots and lots and lots of them in the high school auditorium on January 12th. We'll do a variation of this PowerPoint We'll also do an additional piece for the parents, which is an orientation PowerPoint to what can you expect in kindergarten. Besides the fact that it's full day, there are lots of wonderful things that you can experience, that your child will experience as resources, and we'll build that PowerPoint into that evening as well. Sarah? Uh, I would say the one piece I see missing from here that I think is sort of key is that if the budget does not pass, if the budget does not pass, this is not impacted. Okay. Because remember, the, the definition of default right. is new money, and this is using money we currently have already. Okay, excellent. So this is not a victory. So this is going to happen. This is going to happen. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right. Great. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Deb, Dennis. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for all the work you've put into this. Well, you said it's it. It's exciting. <clears throat> I tried to establish in Summersworth kindergarten in a five-year plan starting in 1974. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, for the second uh, major um, report, uh, full day, the full uh, the, the start time update. Right, and in this case, I'll ask Todd and Corey to come to the microphone um, just to kind of cue this one up. We had um, a, uh, <clears throat> several things happen. We formed a staff committee this fall. We've met a couple of times. Uh, we've done two different surveys. Uh, one is a narrative survey. I did a narrative survey on purpose. I wanted um, staff to, who were going to respond to respond in writing so I could get a better sense of what they were thinking. And. Um, the feedback from staff was great. About two-thirds of the staff who responded were supportive of a change. But one of the pieces of feedback I consistently got was it wasn't clear that a staff member could choose not to change. So I followed up the narrative survey with a survey monkey type of survey where it's just con connect, uh, con color in the dot that you want to see happen. And in that survey, it was consistent with the narrative survey, not quite as uh, dominant. The response was 56% of the staff were in favor of some change to the schedule, and 44% uh, were not. Now, the 56% comes from, I gave them three options. One option was to maintain the current arrangement with the buses, where the middle school and high school went first, and the elementary followed. The second option was that we, we flip them and the elementary went first and the high school and middle school went uh, second. The third option was a combination of both. If you didn't care which one, you could say A and B. And the last option was please don't change the schedule basically. 
And um, so I took A, B, and C and collapsed them into open to change and then not open to change. And, you know, I, I was so impressed with the staff responses. They were thoughtful. Um, they, they were concerned um, about the impact for various reasons. Some were concerned about having elementary kids uh, be out so early in the morning, even though we established 7 o'clock as the first pickup. Um, other concerns at the elementary would surprise me. Res uh, were, they were concerned about the athletic program right straight through K-12. Um, other concerns were about child care and the current arrangement. An older child can get home before a primary child and maybe a parent is relying on that um, older child. So I gave you a copy of all the comments so you can peruse through them. Um, I, uh, you know, some of them are very personal. You know, for me, I'm an early person, so the current schedule works best, and it provides me time to help students at the end of the day. If the schedule changes, I'm not sure I'd be able to help students at the end of the day. So you can see how the thought process was. I took nothing out. I didn't edit anything. You have the raw data there for you to look at. I was, I kept on telling Todd as the results were coming in, I'm just so impressed with how the staff um, took this seriously. And when we did the Survey Monkey, I think we had 136 responses, uh, so it's pretty comprehensive. That's about 70%, 68, 79%, 70% of the, of the faculty who took the time to respond. Um, the way that I did the Survey Monkey, it was broken out by elementary, middle school, and high school, but I couldn't, I couldn't disaggregate the data. I just saw the number of responses coming in, but I didn't know whether, you know, Massway was in favor and Moharamit wasn't. That wasn't part of the deal. It was really looking at the staff as a whole. Uh, so uh, having said all of that, we did want to address what we think is the elephant in the room, and that's why I asked Corey and Todd to come up and talk about um, athletics because that's a common theme not just for our district but across all districts who begin to have this conversation and uh, so I'm going to turn it over to these gentlemen. Great. Good evening everyone. Um, we put a couple slides together to kind of walk through what we're going to talk about but I, I did want to start with if you're not familiar with the high school athletic program given the state of New Hampshire and so many opponents away from us we already are, are encountering a, a, a decent amount of dismissed time for student athletes to leave to attend a, a baseball game at Wyndham or, or wherever the case may be. Um, so I wanted to start with to talk about what we're currently doing and what we've been doing, at least in the time frame that I've been here, to kind of uh, minimize disruptions for being a student athlete. And, and it certainly starts with the preseason meeting and discussing to the students the expectation and, and being a student first. and. Nothing's going to trump that at any point, regardless of what activity you're a part of here at Oyster River. And so with that, I wanted to kind of just kind of walk through the process of once a individual is wanting to try out for a team. And so when the NHIAA has stick strict guidelines on being able to be eligible for athletics. And so those guidelines are you must pass at least four classes with a D or higher, and you cannot fail more than one class. Um, I think everyone in, in the room would probably agree those are pretty low standards from the big picture of what we're trying to do. However, I think it is important worth noting we go off the NHI standards for being eligible to try out and participate with the team. Once you make a team, it's, it's a very different expectation for being a student athlete for um, representing Oyster River. And so what we do is once an individual has made a team, immediately we send a blast to all the staff um, with the breakdown of rosters of every team, alphabetical, by grade, by sport, whatever the case may be, so that teachers are starting to identify who is participating on an extracurricular team at Oyster River. And so they can start thinking of that if someone's showing behavioral issues in class, not you know clearly visibly tired in class, not doing their work, whatever the case may be, and, and the teachers are really doing a fabulous job of shooting me an email right away, and so we start to hit the ground running when it's a very small issue at that point. In addition to that, every Friday I run a great track for every student athlete participating on a team. And so that, between 215 to 250 athletes, will run a report and any student that is showing a grade below a C minus will get an email from me Friday or Saturday that also CC mom and dad 
simply saying, you know, in running power school this week, we noticed there's a grade below C minus. Please take a look at it. See, make sure power school is accurately displaying your grade and touch base with me on Monday of the following week. Um, we do that every week throughout the season. Generally, kids early in the sports season will have to come see me on Monday. And what we'll do at that point is we'll engage their counselor, we'll engage the teacher, and pull up power school literally as you all can as parents and see why a grade is a certain grade, whether it's missing assignments, whether it's struggling in a quiz or a test or blown off a project. You know, the dialogue there is very personal at that point, working with each student athlete. And so based on how that conversation is going, we'll create a, a individual plan for each individual. And, and certainly before talking about any um, consequences or loss of playing time or not being at practice, you know, we'll talk through what the best plan of action for each individual is. And there's always a time frame for that individual to prove himself or herself in showing the academic um, effort and success prior to potentially losing any eligibility at that point. The reason for that is one, big picture, we want them to be successful on a daily basis academically. The other side of it is many of our sports overlap each quarter. And so at the end of each quarter, the NHIA says, Mr. Allen, you gotta check off a box, send in the affidavit, all your student athletes are eligible. That day moving forward, the loss of eligibility is permanent for the next quarter. And so we would never wanna be in a situation where in the middle of the winter, first week of February or so, we have to tell student athletes, you're no longer a part of this team because you struggled and didn't pass the academic requirements with the NHIA. And because at that point, you lose your eligibility for the entire next quarter. And so you can prove yourself academically before you regain eligibility. So this is one thing we, we watch very closely all quarters, but certainly through the winter. And then again in the spring, because your fourth quarter determines your following fall. And so a lot of student athletes, especially ninth graders, don't necessarily connect those dots. So those student athletes that are fall athletes, we monitor all spring the same way we monitor our spring athletes. So um, I get a lot of eye rolls and a lot of kids that come to my office on those, those first couple Mondays of each sports season. But it's important worth noting, and I think a lot of the parents appreciate it, that we're trying to minimize the problem before it becomes a larger problem. And a lot of time, it, it is a time management issue. And so it's a great dialogue that we work with the coach and, and getting extra help or going to office hours or in your free periods, taking advantage of the great opportunities we have here and seeing a uh, specific subject teacher to really kind of bolster the academics and, and grasping the knowledge of what you're doing. Um, so, so that happens currently with all our teams. And, and I'm, this is one of the more proud stats that I've been able to uh, provide to you guys. This fall, we had 220. 222 fall student athletes. Only 10 students in the first quarter showed a grade of below a C minus. When you really start breaking that down for the end of the quarter, that shows exceptional buy-in to what we're trying to do and being a student before being a student athlete. And so I think that's extremely successful. And then cumulative average of our fall student athletes. Um, and that two to three tenths is it's pretty much the national average for people participating in extracurriculars and being on a sports team and having that um, extra responsibility, if you will, with a school, um, I think it bolsters the academic success, certainly because it's watched um, by hopefully all athletic directors across the nation. But certainly here, that is definitely the case. And so it shows with the overall GPA please average. Yeah, please do. Yeah, just to kind of add on to that, I think um, when you look at the big picture of athletic participation in Oyster River High School, over the course of the year, 73% of our kids are involved. So when you look at a grade point average like we saw in the fall, that extends to all three seasons. And I think it's important when you think of the Oyster River sports culture, academics is still the highest priority that our, our student athletes have, absolutely. Very high performing kids. I mean, the, the fact that our student body grade point average is a 3.24 for the first quarter, that is a, an amazing thing. Kids are really, they're putting a lot of time and energy. And the fact that 85% you know, of our kids get into a four year college and graduate, you know, that, that kind of stuff um, gives you a sense of the, the, who, who we're dealing with to begin with. So I know we're, we're talking a lot about the, the culture around athletics, 
But before we get into you know, the, 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 the class time and all of that sort of thing with regards to if we change the start time, it's important to know where we're starting from. And right now, I think it's really important that people realize that athletics are a very positive influence in our students' academic progress in, at Oyster River. And I think that's borne out by the data. Very well said. Thanks, Todd. So that's kind of what we're doing currently. And again, that regardless of the start time or the end time of our school day, none of that will change. The, the next slide breaks down um, the exact minutes of each of our athletic programs and what they're currently missing. And so I, I kind of put three scenarios up there as far as time frames. And as you can see, there in select sports, we are missing a decent amount of uh, school time. I will add, um, especially for the programs that lose a lot of the last period of the day, um, the expectations are, are uh, daily with those students in those classes. And certainly if someone subs their toe, the time frame as far as fixing your grade, it's, it's a much quicker conversation we do with those teachers, especially in some subjects where missing 45 minutes of instruction time can drastically affect the next day and for whatever case may be. And so those, those are conversations that happen immediately when a student falls below a C minus grade and, and directly with the teacher. Um, and there have been occasions where the student athlete themselves have said, you know what, it's probably best if I don't go or I'll try to go with my parent after school today and try to get to the game on time for the start time. So um, I just wrote down the times there for each of them. It's fairly obvious if you start thinking about it, you know, daylight is, is um, our biggest factor, obviously, and not having lights on any of our facilities or a lot of the facilities we participate at, we're really kind of um, dependent on sunlight. And so certainly the beginning of the spring seasons, uh, the necessary need to start games at 4 p.m for baseball or softball or track meet have to happen. As we get later in the spring, sometimes we'll start games at 4.30 to offset. Like when we travel to Kennett, we'll do a 4.30 game late in the year so that we're less uh, minimizing our uh, loss of school time. And then on the flip side, in the fall, early part of the season, we can start games at 4.30, whereas as we get closer to mid-October and later October, we have to try to start for a 3.45 game, mainly to get it in before um, the sun sets. And then I just kind of tried to put a visual together as far as the actual breakdown where we travel across the state. This is locations that, of all our high schools that we compete against or their locations if they are not at the high school. As you can see, there's, there's a small amount in the seacoast area. Um, the main reason, because it's so diverse, and uh, you may be thinking there's a lot more high schools in our area, this is based off our enrollment size and the division we're put in. Um, so primarily schools between 600 and 1100 is the division that we participate in athletics. So the likes of Exeter and Spalding and Dover, those don't show them, don't show on here, but neither does Summersworth or Newt, or Newmarket. Um, so that's why obviously our, our, our radius is much larger for transportation purposes. And then certainly, you know, things that we can discuss, and, and I think I know Dr. Morris, Mr. Allen and I have considered this and, and talking with a lot of the coaches as well. I, I think I've already alluded to a couple things that were some somewhat uh, unavoidable is obviously daylight and the lack of lights for a lot of facilities and then distance to away events. Those are two type things that I we can't necessarily change how far it is from here to Merrimack Valley High School. Um, but factors we can certainly consider, and I know a lot of school districts are, are having these similar conversations, are as taking advantage of Saturdays and Sundays more often. Right now, we really don't participate with a lot of athletic events on the weekends, minus larger um, meets like swimming and diving and cross country. Primarily those are in track and field. Those are primarily on the weekends because they're larger invitationals with that need six to eight hours for the meet to finish, whereas most of our games can be two and a half hours in the evenings. Um, so we could definitely move a lot of things off the week. And, and we currently do that with the likes of Hanover or Lebanon. When we play them in soccer, we'll always move those to a Saturday because those are primarily the farthest opponents for us. Um, we try to appreciate and, and let vacation times happen with Labor Day weekends, with Columbus Day weekends, and, and certainly anytime we'll have a school holiday, we try to remove 
athletic games for those days, so families can take advantage of those times. I know the college tour is a big one for Columbus Day weekend, so we try to take that Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday off for sure for games um, so that parents can take kids and go and tour schools. Um, and then certainly the required amount of games. In the NHIA, has a set number of games for each sport that you have to participate in to be eligible for the playoffs. Most schools play two or three extra games. And the reason there's more games on each of our schedules um, is because some schools will compete against non-divisional opponents. So the likes of St. Thomas and Dover, who have always had that rivalry, they'll play each other, although that game is not built into Division Two because Dover is in the big school division, and St. Thomas is in our division. And that, that happens a lot around all over the state. Um, up north a lot with the likes of Kennett and Berlin and White Mountains and a lot of those smaller schools. A couple extra games are built into everyone's schedule for that so that those games can happen. Traditionally, the rest of the state has just picked up two more games within their division if they don't have those out of division rivalries. And so right now, like in um, field hockey, it's a 14 game schedule. The state says you have to play 10 games to be eligible for the playoffs. In soccer, we play 16 games. The state says you have to play 12 games. Um, so that's nothing we're going above and way beyond what the state's doing, but certainly we could look at trying to minimize um, at least one away event within each of our team's schedules. We certainly would be probably playing less than most of the state, but it is one way to, to save an afternoon trip somewhere. To jump in, please. There's one more that could have been added, which uh, I'm reluctant to say because I don't want to be overly political. However, an athletic stadium with lights on it <laughs> <laughs> mitigate much of the problem we're talking about. One of the, in fact, one of the things, if you've been following the Portsmouth uh, conversations, one of the things that they did right up front was they said, we're taking athletics off the table. We don't, we're not going to let that be an issue. The reason they're able to do that is they have nice. multiple well-lit turf fields to be able to use, and therefore daylight is not as much of an issue to them. And obviously if we had that, that could be a fourth thing that we could look at as being part of a scenario that would allow us to be able to adapt. I did not tell him to say that. <laughs> I, didn't script. I assume you're in agreement. It works smooth, though. but <laughs> I didn't say, say it. So that, that as far as information from us to you all um, is all we have, but we're happy to answer any questions anyone may have. I, first of all, thank you so much um, for this data. I'm very impressed. All the, my questions that I said, I want to see this, I want to see this, it's all here. So I really want to thank you um, for putting that all together. Um, and I, I feel like it, it is thorough and it, it certainly gives us information to really kind of uh, take a look at this and, and see, you know, what if, if this makes sense and how and, and all that kind of thing. Um, just curious as to why boys tennis is like 200 minutes more than girls tennis there. Why would there be such a difference? In, yeah, it's a great question. So in some sports, tennis included, there's some schools that are participating in different divisions. And uh -huh. Hanover and Lebanon and Plymouth be, are in that category. And so the way the schedule broke down, uh, the boys tennis team drew the short end of the straw for this cycle and has more travel time. So they had to go to Plymouth um, for a trip. And I believe their other um, different trip was to Trinity. Oh. Um, so they added probably an hour and a half, two hours there. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd have to look at it. And, and the, that's a great question, though, because I forgot to add. The schedules are two-year cycles. And so every sports schedule that is done throughout the state are done by athletic directors. So four or five ADs will pick up each sport, field hockey, soccer, whatever the case may be. And when we're putting these schedules together, we do take into consideration travel. And so most likely, if you follow a lot of our athletic teams, we never play Hanover and Lebanon. Mm -hmm. We'll only play one of them because in a two-year cycle, you'll rotate home and away. So there's never a two-year gap <coughs> unless we drew them in the playoffs. But um, there's never a two-year period where you would tra travel to Hanover and to Lebanon. You know, we try to minimize if we're going to Conval, uh, which is Peterborough, a fairly large, uh, decent trip away, we'll try to make sure our next farthest trip is maybe the Manchester area. 
And so we take that into consideration. And we also do clusters, um, which is just a scheduling term for trying to minimize. So the likes of Portsmouth, Cole Brown, St. Thomas, schools within 30 minutes that are kind of our natural rivalries, we'll schedule them twice. And so that softens our travel distance time as well for, and also bolsters rivalries and playing those local opponents. Could you just uh, touch upon like, s s uh, the s teams that have the highest amount of sure. on, like, ski team in particular? What are the variables there that are really beyond their control? Well, <laughs> ski team as of now is not going to be a problem, sadly. Um, but <laughs> yeah, obviously there's a couple programs that are unavoidable on our end. Anytime we're renting other facilities, whether it be the Whittemore Center, where generally we start our games at 8.15, because that's the time the ice is available for us, or the pool over at UNH, or, and certainly any mountains. Those schedules are given to us by the mountains through the states, and they simply say, uh, King Pine will come to our scheduling meeting and say, we'll give you this Thursday and this Friday, and that's it. And you, you have to fit everything in, and because the amount of time the mountains, understandably, limit, our availability, we have to bring more teams to each mountain mm -hmm. so that everyone's getting an, a fair schedule so that everyone gets the same amount of times to uh, participate. Because of that, there is um, a time where the ski team will be away all day mm -hmm. for their state meet, right. whereas the state basketball championship or soccer championships is on a Saturday. Right. The mountain will never give us a Saturday to participate because it's tourism season. So um, that is a Tuesday or a Thursday. So that's considerable amount of time that they're missing in those cases. So, you know, those student athletes, and, and I say that at the meetings, is there's a higher expectation academically, mainly because when they have a meet, they need to leave at 1145 yeah. instead of 245 for a baseball team or a soccer team. So, you know, the expectation of academic success is even stronger. And so when we have those meetings with the parents, we really try to outline that. The ski meeting is one of the longer meetings uh, preseason wise because it, it's important that the parents understand the commitment and the kids understand the buy-in for the academics of it. Can I have one? Okay. I'd like to ask one. Oh, sure. okay. I have a question for Todd. Uh, this goes to the alternatives that essentially were put out to the, uh, to the teachers. And I'm just wondering if there's one other alternative that we might want to take a look at, which is to have a more flexible high school schedule, similar to like a university, like, you know, like the sleep schedules of college freshmen are not particularly good either, you know, and, but we still have eight o'clock classes because reasons. for some students, it fits what they need and, and, uh, and they may have to practice a sport in the afternoon. So, so I'm wondering like, <clears throat> if there may be a possibility of, uh, and I'm not sure how many periods you have in the day, but assuming it's like seven, is that correct? Right. Seven, day, seven. Seven. Yeah. Um, that starts at seven twenty-five and ends somewhere like two two thirty something. Like seven that. thirty-five to two thirty every day. Okay. Yep. What if you added a f an eighth eighth period? Okay. Mm -hmm. So that if somebody, <clears throat> you know, so some, the students would have the option of starting at the seven twenty-five, and I think for some that might be important, mm -hmm. right. or they might like, you know, they might be used to it. They might mm -hmm. find. That, you know, the students take at eight o'clock at UNH because sure. they need to or they want to. But but if somebody <clears throat> wanted to start later, they could start at in second period and still get the same. Right. You know whether, and, and I know that the schedule is so complicated, but it might opening up <clears throat> extra times might create even more options for students. Sure. And then if you were in an athletic event where you had to leave, but the same time you leave now, you would just not schedule an eighth period class. Mm -hmm. So you could still finish at the same time, which is particularly what, what athletes at the university do. You know, if you have, if you have to play, practice you know, track at three o'clock, you know you have to get your classes in earlier. So right. I just, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's logistics that there may be even issues with con contractual issues with that, but whether that, and that might even open the door down the line to, to use, the, use the school at different times to maybe have an evening senior seminar or something where somebody could come in twice and not two nights and for a seminar length course where you're not, you know. So I'm just wondering if that might be a way of thinking about it. Well, so, certainly I think uh, there are more flexible structures that we could look at than the one that we currently use. Um, we're, we're, you know, a seven period day is, is a pretty traditional school structure. I mean, probably most people who went to high school had a pretty typical six, seven or eight, uh, eight period day. Um, and yeah, there are there are other structures that we could look at that might um, provide uh, choice opportunities for students, um, but also uh, 
on the other side, maybe expand opportunities that exist. We, we already do things like uh, run after school English classes through um, um, the Dover Adult Ed to be able to help students that are, are struggling to pick up like a, they'll take an English class for like 12 weeks that meets two or three hours a day late in the afternoon for multiple days in a row and they earn a full credit that way. So there are lots of different structures that we certainly could look at um, and, and I'd certainly be open to that. That is a process that um, would take quite a bit of time to, to work it through, but I, yeah. I, I do, I guess I think, the one thing I, 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 as I think about the issue of start time, if we move the start time but do nothing else differently, the number of hours our kids are engaged in things, if it all remains the same, we haven't expanded the, the time that kids have for sleep and rest, and so we, we do need to look at that. So I do think, regardless of what we do, we need to look at what we're doing in the, during the school day and make sure we're maximizing it and minimizing the um, amount of downtime and waste time kids have so that they can um, accomplish as much as they can so that student athletes can participate and, and frankly um, just maximize academic opportunities for kids all the way around. Ken? Okay. Um, maybe a comment and a question and, and, and maybe following up with Tom. I think that this, the data you know, that we've seen about having later start time is, is you know, very convincing and, and I think we all agree that this is something very important to explore. I, I could see probably we'll need to reach out to community and open this up to community discussion. And I think though when we talk about making the change and I think to emphasize maybe what Tom said, rather than our looking at those two rigid models of just throwing everything later or just swapping, maybe this is the time where we can really creatively look at what a school day means and see if we can add that sort of piece to it. And, and so I, I agree with Tom and I think this is something we should explore. And, and it pertains maybe to the question I would ask, because you mentioned time when people are gonna be traveling to games. But given the scenario of what our current fields are now, what about practice time as well um, with that later start? And how do you foresee, um, you know, and it probably doesn't pertain so much, let's say, to basketball and it won't pertain to swimming, but if we're talking about, you know, the soccer programs, the field hockey programs, if, if we're having that later, are we gonna be telescoping practice time? How is that gonna work? Yeah, if, if nothing behind us was to change, um, it, we, it would take some creativity and so, some compromises from some of our training sessions. I, I think it's safe to assume by moving our start time, uh, the idea of morning practices wouldn't necessarily be favorable because it's kind of contradictory moving school time. Because um, I know a lot of coaches, that was their first thought was, well, geez, we could get in at seven, practice seven to eight twenty-five, <laughs> and then the kids could go home. And, and, and defeat you know, the whole I mean, the reality in the fall. I mean, truthfully, in the in June, July, and uh, mainly August, before uh, a lot of our workout sessions, they start at six thirty in the morning. That's primarily because of temperatures, right? Because they'll work out and. Yeah. And a lot of the kids have jobs and summer jobs, so it's kind of a good time to get in, get a good workout in for an hour, and then be on their way to whatever they're doing for the rest of the day. Um, so I kind of stop the dialogue right there with the coaches and take that idea out of the equation. <laughs> I can certainly welcome it back and create a, a, a practice schedule for you, but um, certainly without lights and without any change in our facilities, we would need to compromise our practice time frame. So uh, a 90 minute practice may need to go down to 75 minutes or 60 minutes and the potential of sharing facilities, uh, whereas right now field hockey teams can practice back to back and soccer could practice back to back because the window of daylight is longer, we would probably definitely need to consider sharing a field or at least minimizing their, their training time frames. And then certainly the, the alternative to that is, is looking at more opportunities of practices on the weekends if we didn't shift games to the weekends. I know our, our, a lot of our coaches try to, to reserve the weekends for downtime for jobs, family, whatever the case may be. So that may be times we could add in for practice for the teams if, we did, if that was the direction we wanted to go. And, and, maybe, and it would be a cost 
and probably significant costs, but are there, is, does UNH have additional rentals? I mean, is that, it's an, an um, not very I, ideal times. They'd be less ideal times. And, and I think that would be very difficult to, to schedule with them, yeah. just because their schedule's very involved. So I, I know the few times we try to rent the turf field for in preparation for playoffs or rain outs and we need to, it's very challenging to find times, especially during their academic year. Um, so I can look into it and, and kind of give you an idea, but I, I don't think that would be easy to do. But it, and, and I think hearing that really supports the idea that you raised, that we should try to look at that more flexible way and yeah. see if that is a possibility. I, I, Carolyn, I, I'd just be interested in, and then we talked a little bit about your sense of students. <clears throat> is your sense that students would prefer to uniformly to move to a later time, or do you think there'd be a difference of opinion? Some students would want to start early, and some might start, some might be okay to start at 7.30, and some might want to start at like 8.30. What, what's your sense of it? Yeah, I talked to a lot of students this week about what their opinions were on the whole start change. Um, and I posed the question, like, how do you feel about it? And initially, everyone's kind of just, oh, yeah, I get to sleep in more, and they're really into it. And then they start thinking about it more, and then they start asking questions about their sports. And that's what everybody mainly has been concerned about is, like, I'm already running track and cross country, and it's dark by the time it ends. How am I going to start running, and it's going to be dark the whole entire time? Um, they're really concerned about, like, after-school activities that aren't um, through the school. Like, I know a lot of my friends are on dance teams, I'm on a crew team, and that's not through the school. So scheduling-wise, that definitely messes up a lot of people and their whole um, after-school activities. And so everybody initially thinks, yeah, I want to start later. But when they, everybody that I talk to does a lot of activities, and they were very concerned about how their activities would be affected and what they would end up doing with those. Could I just follow up? You know, do you, is it your sense that the early morning start students aren't really ready to to, to learn, or, or is that a different? Some are and some aren't. Or you know, what's what's the what's it like to be in that 7:30 class? I've never yeah. alert that time myself, so I don't know. <laughs> my personal um, experience, like my first A and B period, I'm kind of sometimes I'm just don't remember what happened because I'll be like really tired. And then by my C period class, it's like 9:15. I'm totally awake. Um, so it really depends on the, the student. I know my sister sleeps in really late, and so she doesn't wake up until like her D period class. <laughs> so it really depends on how that person sleeps and how they end up feeling in the morning. Because I know a lot of my friends are like super awake when they get into their A period class, and a lot of people don't want to don't want to talk to them because they're not <laughs> they're not ready for that type of enthusiasm. <laughs> but I think it really depends on the student and how they <laughs> take that upon themselves. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Can I just ask you one more? Yes. And I'll, I'll stop. Do you think if students start, if they, they had a later start time, would students stay up just later? I mean, would they get, actually get more sleep? Yeah. No, I definitely think if I, I know from my friends, my siblings, me personally, if I was told that I can go to school at 8, not 7, I can wake up at, like, I wake up at 5.50 every morning. And if I was told, oh, I can wake up at 6.50, I would stay up later and do more things after school, because I would know, like, oh, I don't have to be home at this time, because I know I can sleep in later. So I feel like I would definitely get less, like the same amount of sleep that I'm getting now, versus getting more. Yeah. Thank you. One thing I do, oh, I'm sorry. No, that's OK. I'm going to take it back to Dr. Moore. So if you want to comment on something Just said. real quickly, one thing, because this dialogue is, is really interesting stuff, and there's a lot of schools having this conversation, we currently do have morning practices for swimming right. on select dates. Um, boys hockey has it, indoor track because of our limited availability at UNH. And given the gym is their most ideal environment, if you're not on a track, practice in the mornings. Um, through the winter, I'm going to gauge and try to get a good sample of students, um, both that are morning people and some that are not, that are participating in those workouts. I know some feedback last year talking directly with indoor track because that was a brand new thing that they tried last year. We got a lot of positive feedback from the kids because they 
loved the fact that they could go home after school and they didn't have a practice or they had dentists or jobs or whatever the case may be. And by the time they were in class, they were awake because they got here at you know, five, 10 past 6 a.m. and worked out for an hour before going to the class. So I plan to do that more throughout this winter and I'll happily report back probably in March when the season's done and try to get a snapshot of five or six kids in each sport and then on the flip side, try to get kids, basketball student athletes that don't have morning practices and try to compare some kind of data for you all. Sarah? Um, I have a few questions and then uh, comments. Uh, Jim, how were these A, B, C, D selected as the options to bring forward? Obviously, there are other ways to do this. Yep. Um, we went, th the committee went through about seven different options, and some of them, for example, one that we did not choose to put out was to have all the children run on the same bus run at 9 o'clock, K through 12. It would cost the addition of six additional buses plus six different additional staff. So your initial cost to have a one-run system would be someplace in the avenue of $800,000. Now, the, the buses go away after the first year, but you still now have six additional drivers is an ongoing cost. Um, we looked at 30-minute increments, and the committee just said, if we're gonna go through all this work, 30 minutes really isn't worth the effort. You know, we're gonna go in, let's go in and put meaningful proposals before the staff and not Mickey Mouse around with 15 minutes, 30 minutes. Um, if you look at some of the adjustments that are made uh, across the country, um, a lot of work goes into this, as you can see just from Corey's presentation. And to do that much work for 15 minutes hardly is worth the time and energy. Um, the research was pretty clear that, you know, that the uh, older adolescents needed to be starting, you know, at least an hour later, shooting for nine o'clock. And so we decided as a committee, which each building was represented, um, myself, we decided as a committee to not um, muck around with stuff that was meaningless that what we put forward needed to be meaningful to staff and give them recommendations that we thought we could follow through on. Okay, and, and so the, all the proposals that were put forward, I guess that's my second question, are there any costs, substantial costs, that you would think are coming with any of these plans that you've put forward? There are no additional costs associated with the two plans that the staff reviewed okay. and voted on. Um, no additional buses, no additional bus drivers, um, you know, unintended consequences, uh, you know, there might be, Corey might say, you know, I really would like to have this happen and it's going to cost a little bit more to have it happen as he, gets, as he was talking about being creative and so forth. We haven't had that conversation, but whatever costs are associated with these two proposals would be incidental. And in and, and sitting there doing these two proposals, we couldn't think of any cost, but it doesn't mean there aren't any. I mean, I can see Corey coming up with something. Be pretty much. <laughs> then I guess my, my, <laughs> my comments for these, I guess I don't dispute the science. I don't dispute that if people get more sleep, they will be more, it's better. I don't dispute that. Um, what I do, what I keep coming back to is that everyone is an individual. I think watching musical concerts, there is nothing clearer than to watch 100 kids on a stage than to, to realize how different every kid is on that stage. Um, and so I think the start time piece is a bigger deal for some kids than others. And I do worry also, I do, worry that this is just one piece of the problem that we have in the society. We don't have enough hours in our days. And um, I worry that things are just gonna get shifted right. to the front of the day, then to the back. And I hear parents you know, say, oh, I'm so concerned about my kid being stressed out. And then that same parent turns to me and says, and I pick them up from school at three o'clock and we go to dance and then we go to gym and then we go, and, and I'm like, I get it. So I am concerned about that. I'm concerned that uh, homework will get put off and kids will do it, you know, those procrastinators will start doing their homework at 7 a.m. 
Um, and I'm worried that I am worried about teachers um, having to, you know, uh, potentially shift if they are able to shift their help time to before school. I mean, all of those things, sports times. And we could, as a board, say we can't have sports practices at the beginning of the day. There's no teacher help at the beginning of the day. I mean, we can do that kind of stuff, but I think people will still find ways around it because the bottom line is every family has its own set of priorities. And some parents, you know, will say, this is a priority for my kid, and so I'm going to make that choice. So I do worry that this is, a, is not just about um, sleep. It's about priorities, and it's, 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 a, it's a bigger piece. So I was very intrigued by the idea of uh, flexibility and more options because, you know, with, with a maybe shifting start times, I don't know. I was also very concerned seeing the elementary kids starting at having a potential 7 a.m. pickup time. I know the research shows that elementary kids get up earlier. Well, I mean, I can only judge off my own kids because that's all I've got. I've got one early riser and two late sleepers. And those late sleepers were able to do afternoon kindergarten. And I just think about if I had a six-year-old that I had to get out of bed at 6.30, you can't reason with a six-year-old like I can reason with my 13-year-old. Um, and so, and those early experiences in school for that kid would be horrendous. So I just go back to it's about the individual and I guess our job, and I still think this, is we're trying to look at the big picture. And that's why I really hope this goes out to, and I know it will, go out to the broader community as far as forums go and a survey because I want to do what, what the community values, but. Mm -hmm. well. So, you know, when I'm listening to this, I, I kind of am having a flashback remembering the high school tuition agreement. And the reason I say that is when we started with that, we started with initially there's this one problem, how do we stabilize the high school population. But when we entered into that talk, actually, one of the big things that came out was not just how to stabilize it, but looking at the school holistically, how can we improve it academically? What are our problem areas? And so out of that, you had like the math lab come out. So in this case, I mean, of course, like getting kids in an optimal time already is an academic improvement. But what are our other need areas in both the elementary, the middle school, the high school? What, what are our problem areas? Because if we're going to open up the schedule, we might as well also throw them there so that when we begin to look at what the options are, what ticks off the most of those? What really allows us to best hit as many problems as we can? And so I think that's, you know, where we should be headed. And so I know there's going to be, you know, forms and all that, but really working to adjust what's the best setup, not just the easiest setup. And I, because again, it's a big change for everybody. We might as well try to get as many problems cleared off if if we can. Okay. It's I think it's it's eight thirty. I think we're going to have we have Warren article issues to to go into. I wonder if we could uh, <clears throat> schedule either a section of a board meeting or a workshop. I think where we would talk about it and then I think decide how we would want to go forward moving to the public. I, myself, I think we're not ready to go to take options out because we're just, we just heard, it says we heard them right, today, right, yeah. right? So would that be agreeable to move on and then we would reschedule and uh, I'll talk with Dr. Morrison and talk with Al and think whether it should be a, a workshop voted to this or whether we have a section of a meeting, but I think we, we probably have to move on. Denise? Just one quick comment because I, I do, and I was going to bring up the fields if you didn't, but you know, part of this I really do feel kind of hinges like that it could get clearer as if we know in the spring that we have the fields going through. Uh -huh. You know, I, I mean, I do feel like we need more time to kind of look and see. Okay, great. Okay. So, um, Thank you all for the presentation. Thank those of you that came to observe on that topic. Thank you for being here. Um, we will need to move on, I think, to uh, the Warren articles. So this is the shift. <coughs> okay. Sue, you want to join us at the podium? 
so it seems to me and that we have a couple tasks here. One is to, we have two warrant articles that we have not approved. That's the new one that uh, we have a, uh, for the non-lapsing equipment revolving fund. And we have the final budget warrant article, which is number seven on the uh, original. I think it'll end up being number eight. But it's number seven that we finally have the numbers in. Is that correct? So there's two that we have, two warrant articles we have not approved. Right. And then we have not approved the language, for the descriptions for any of them. Uh, so um, I, I'm wondering if it's a procedure we could go to the two warrant articles, approve those, then begin working on the, lang the descriptive language. Would that make sense? And when we get to the descriptive language, if we could maybe do it as a, you know, I, I, I kind of dread this group, group <laughs> editing, you know, as an English teacher, you know, I know, you know, having been in department meetings when we've done this, uh, uh, I know this can be tricky, but, uh, but we'll, we'll do, maybe just do that, try to get some consensus about language, and even if it's not the most elegant, as long as it's clear and informative. So uh, <clears throat> I wonder if we could maybe start with a motion to uh, approve uh, the draft of the sample warrant article for the revolving fund, and, and then see. Which one? I'm, trying, I'm having a hard time even finding sure. that one. Is it on our new, which, which, art, which article is it? It's I think not, it was it's sent. It's not on here then. So it was it sent? Separate, it's it's it was not sent on separately? here. It's a separate no, it's thing. not. We have not okay. included it on there I, That's what is I was the, confused the, about. This, I was like, I don't okay. see it Could anywhere. You, it's, it's by itself. Um, okay. If you it, go back on, to your section have, where you have uh, the original warrants, it's right at the bottom of that list it says suggested wording for warrant article under what section under section discussion, on which, discussion. Which it's under discussion so get discussion or, okay yeah. the very last oh, suggested one. wording okay yeah. got yeah, it yeah and and so this is a conversation that came up between uh, our IT director Sue and I we have um, equipment that has served its purpose as a, as, a, as a functional school piece of equipment, but for children who um, may not have anything would be a piece of equipment that might have some meaning to them. So like an iPad from the second generation, we have a lot of those that um, are going off their life cycle. And so what historically we do is we do donate them or they sell, we sell them as excess um, uh, equipment. And I was talking to Sue, what I used to do in Maine, which is why this Warren article is required because I didn't need it in Maine, is when we took equipment offline, we would see if families um, who qualify for free or reduced lunch could use the piece of equipment, iPads or a laptop or what have you. And then the other thing we would do is then, you know, sell, sell the, uh, unused equipment that's no longer usable to us, so you know we might be able to sell that for 30 bucks or 20 bucks or 25 bucks. Um, but the way that that works now is that that sale automatically goes into the general fund. And what I would like to do with the board's support um, is create a fund where that money went into uh, this equipment revolving fund and then we could use that as an additional resource to purchase uh, for our neediest students um, uh, equipment that they, could no, they couldn't afford as a family, whether it's a laptop or an iPad, um, something technological, thumb drives, small things, um, that kind of thing. So, you know, we might generate maybe a couple thousand dollars out of this in the course of um, a sale. Uh, the other thing we've done with this equipment is we've donated it to um, nonprofits. So I, I was thinking if we're donating it to nonprofits, well, why wouldn't we benefit our own students first and then continue to have a fund to help our neediest children when it comes to them having the equipment they need to function equally with other families. So this was a concept that I did do in Maine. Didn't, all it required was board approval, but in New Hampshire, it requires an, a whole warrant. And so um, I just bring it to you for consideration. If it seems like it's something that appeals to you, then we'd suggest adding the warrant article to the March um, deliberative session. If it doesn't, then we still fo go forward and sell the equipment. We just put it in the general fund, and it gets carried into that 
$450,000 that we carry from one year to the other. So can I just ask a clarification? Mm -hmm. So you, you're going to sell equipment, not necessarily to, the, to students who No, are, not to our kids who are in um, okay. need. Sell equipment and then that <coughs> money goes into a fund and then use that fund to say buy some of the used equipment that is still usable that, that helps maybe you know them become have the technology they might need to do some of their school work that they right so it'd be the the fund for, there's two levels to it so if a youngster is in need we just hand them the ipad too as, but we needed your permission to do that if a youngster needed something that we didn't have then we have a little fund here to be able to assist that youngster in getting the things they would need so that they would have the same resources as most of our children in the district. We're talking that, you know, currently our level of poverty in the district is is one of the lowest in the state, it's 8%, but that's still 8% of the kids who don't have the wherewithal, whose families don't have the wherewithal to help them um, get the things they need to, in, in, in a technology uh, way. And this would create a little mini fund that Josh and Sue would monitor to make sure that these kids had the things they needed to be successful students. Okay. I'm, I'm very supportive of this, and I would certainly vote in favor of it. I'm wondering if we could add a line for clarification that would say this is not going to result in any um, further tax burden to the public or some language to that effect to, so people... Sure. Yeah, I, I, well, I think in an explanation, we don't, what we don't have here is an explanation, and I think that if we... Uh, I'm not sure how the timing works, but if we support this, whether you could come to our next meeting with an explanation, uh, you know, and, and so that could be part of it. Okay. Um, that's perfect. Would that, so we could approve the, approve the warrant if that's agreeable, uh, and then uh, have the explanation that we would approve in the next meeting. Is that that's great for you? Yeah. Okay. So I, I would move that we approve the warrant to establish the non-lapsing equipment resolve, revolving fund, which will be used for the purposes that have been stated. Moved by Kenny, is there a second? Seconded by Maria. Is there further question on this, Denise? Yeah, I, I'm just concerned about the timing of this. I, I'm in favor of this. I just worry about it being on the warrant this year because I'm afraid that people will be confusing that with the, um, you know, facilities development capital reserve, and then we're selling the property, and and I'm just a little bit concerned that it it's going to be distracting, and and people are going to be more confused, and you know, I I'm wrestling with it because I I think it's a great idea. I just don't know if it should be on this year or if we really should wait till next year to do it. It's my only concern. This exact conversation the three of us were having administratively. You know, timing is everything, and my concern was it's one more warrant, but these kids aren't going away, right. and so I get torn between doing it now or doing it later. But on that, well. you know, I'm wondering if we do a good job on the explanation, because it really is a, not a huge amount of money right. relative, that I think if, you know, it's just going to be our burden to be really clear exactly what this fund means, because I think that's what the problem is. When you get all these funds, no one has any idea anymore what the fund is doing. So, I mean, I think we can do it. We're just going to have to be really careful about the explanation. Because we're essentially creating, like, we have the facilities Facilities Development Capital Reserve, which we've already established, right? So that fund is there, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we're not creating any other new fund in this in in, in these in these articles. Is that correct? Correct. We're just okay. putting money into. We're putting money, money into, into it. it. So this is the only new fund that we're creating. I can certainly understand D Denise's point. You know that it complicates the uh, the warrants. Um, I'm just I'm just concerned that people will start to confuse them and you know think this is for that and that you know, I don't know I just I, I worry about it because I'm concerned you know I really want to see these I think what we have down here these are important you know for us to to move forward with our goals so I don't know. Mm -hmm.
think that's a serious. I mean, that's a serious question. Yeah. I'd like to just not close that down because I think I think if it, anything, and we worked so hard on these issues. Anything that would, if if, if this would distract from them, if the committee, if the board feels that, I think it's it undermines work we've done, even for a, for a good cause. If that's if if we feel that way, yeah. I have a question on that. So right now, all right. So for this say next year can you just lend the equipment to the student i mean sure. how does that i mean mm -hmm. we could i mean you could just lend them the equipment let them use it we haven't given it to them but that doesn't preclude us giving or mm -hmm. utilizing it to the neediest kids and and we, that way we could do that for a year yes. the, the athletic thing would hopefully pass and then put it on the next year and it wouldn't disadvantage the students that way and it would keep our warrants minimized the immediate need would be addressed I would like to bring it back in another year mm -hmm. when we're not um, concerned about the number of warrants okay I, and I appreciate that sentiment as well I feel though who knows what's going to happen next year and and so maybe <coughs> the time won't be right next year and then also and I don't know if it's true or not but kind of thinking of psychology 101, if we have some straightforward things well explained that people say yes to, once you say yes a couple of times, you kind of keep saying yes. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should reorganize Get the our ball rolling. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> but yeah. So to okay. sort of piggyback off of Kenny's point, and I do agree with all the points that have been shared, um, I think the description is what we're lacking here. And it's the, 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 the potential answer to this question. Um, what if we put this off until the next meeting? Have, have the opportunity to read that description. We may feel more comfortable that it you know, doesn't detract from the other warrants that we're putting out there. And I do agree that you know, we don't want to be piling on. Um, but at the same time, I mean, I, I sense that um, there's a lot of support for this. I know I support it. Um, yeah. And um, you know, I think it's it's not something that would necessarily be responsible to put off for another year. So, in the delaying it for until the next meeting doesn't impact your other work tonight. There's no right. implication on the other warrants. So, so can we? Put so I'll withdraw, withdraw my motion. Okay. If that helps. I just want to be clear that we we still have the next meeting to we create do. a warrant. We could still create the yep. warrant. So if you came back with a description mm -hmm. and would that be uh, so if you'd withdraw the motion and why don't we just postpone the okay. motion okay okay oh, table. That, I, yeah. I, that's what you can do okay do we have to do you have to vote to postpone no okay sarah had a question sarah go ahead uh, just one piece of feedback and i support this as well i think the one thing that concern you know as far as going in your explanation the one thing that concerned me was that made me feel better was the small amount of money that we're talking about mm -hmm. right you know you're talking you're going to generate two thousand dollars and use that mm -hmm. two thousand dollars right. to me this warrant article is not terribly complicated it's straightforward as compared to article mm -hmm. six <laughs> where it says we're raising money mm -hmm. which we're not since we already have it yeah, I know. so yeah. if we if we can trust the community to deal with lawyer language that is meant to confuse you mm -hmm. i am confident that they can deal with mm -hmm. this one so, um, got direction. So we're going to postpone, postpone the vote on this, agreeable, and that we'll come back and uh, have a have a a um, description or explanation of it, um, and then we'll vote on that in the next meeting. Is that? And we'll have to. I mean, there'll be no. <laughs> we're really kind of coming up against the deadline. Okay. Um, okay. So Article Seven. Okay. Um, which has the amounts in, uh, and this is kind of, um, you know, we have the, the back out, the back up uh, statistics from Sue on this. Mm -hmm. So could I have a motion to approve Article 7? Oh, oh. Denise? I'll move to um, approve Article 7 as written. Moved by Denise. Is there a second? Seconded by Al. 
Is there discussion on this? Hearing none, all those in favor, please raise your hands. Seven no. in favor. Seven in favor, the student rep in favor. Article seven is passed. Um, we could move to, then back to the language. So, so all articles, all the seven are, the, except for one and two, the, the articles that are on here have all been approved. Now we have to, we have to uh, approve the explanations. Can so I just could we, ask I'm sorry. you a question? Did you get the most recent update from Wendy that the attorney reviewed and made some changes the, with, with the red? Yeah, okay. With the red. okay. Just want to make sure you have that. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was in the packet. It's in, the, in your folder. In the folder. I'll give you mine. I'll give you mine. Is everybody, I'm not sure that I. There you go. Okay, let's just. The first one was Article 3, where she just suggested that instead of utilizing that expendable trust fund to just say that it's from the undesignated fund balance, which it would be okay. Okay. at 400. Okay. Well, can I take a crack at well, article? Uh, could we just, I mean, I just want to make sure that everybody saw these, because I'm yeah. not sure that this came to us late, that there's any issue with the, uh, the change in wording, because we approved, we approved the w one, one wording, and now this, these are, I think minor and I think probably legally improving changes to the document. So is there any reservation that anybody has about going forward with these changes? So not talking about the narrative. No, 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 I'm no just, I'm I just want to be careful because, you know, right. <clears throat> the, the wording has been changed and I want to make sure that nobody has a concern about the change. It seems to me that it's just uh, a, a kind of a technical change. Uh, you know, just the wording about the balance. Is that, is that Kenny? The one question I have in Article 3, mm -hmm. in the red changes, where we're talking about the year end undes undesignated fund balance and then use the word surplus, and isn't that redundant if it's an undesignated yeah, but fund yes, balance? Yes, it is. Lawyer. But it's. And do we need that? <laughs> Apparently, we do. <laughs> I just think at this point, probably to, to reword, because we would have to run it by her. I think yeah. any change well, we would make. You, just so you know, these haven't been approved by DRA either. So that's another step that mm -hmm. I hope after it's gone by the attorney, we're, we're good, but they have not gotten back to us yet. Mm -hmm. So. Well, as long as we agree it's redundant, I'm fine to keep it. <laughs> 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 I don't think we'll have a vote on whether it's redundant or not, because that would be pretty redundant. <laughs> That's the wording that we had in Article 6. It also we did, said you're right. We fund balance, that. surplus. We did. We just forgot it. Okay, is there any, any concern about these this wording changes? Or can we, can we, hearing that, okay, we'll go ahead to the, the descriptions, right? Okay, yep. start with number three. Yep. I, just to make one suggestion in the very last sentence for three, I, I kept reading it and I, I wasn't getting it. And I think we should move the word possible and move that word possible to put that after project. Otherwise, I think we need a comma after possible. Yeah, I, I agree with Kenny. Okay. Okay. Could you read it? You read it. Could you read it as a man? So the board anticipates that additional fundraising will make enhancements to the project possible, yeah. to include field lights and dugout. I think that's a clear improvement in my view. Do we need that sentence? Why, why is that sentence? Because I think it it adds to the scope of the project and it defines what our ultimate the realization of that ultimate goal because the lights are going to really extend the use, the dugouts make it safer and better. So I think 
to have that vision is is good. Okay. okay. Is there agreement that that's that change is is the workable? Just Dan. The, the <clears throat> I, I agree with Kenny. Um, should we remove the two after the comma? Because it feels kind of clunky to say that additional fundraising will make enhancements to the project possible, comma, to include field yeah. lights and decking. We could put including. 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 including field field right. Okay. That's okay. The board anticipates that additional funding will make. Uh, Enhancements. Enhancements to the project possible, including field lights and dugouts. Correct. Is that, is yes. that workable? Yeah. Okay. Got it. Al? All right, I'm going to tackle the first part because it's ugly. Uh, I, I, I keep ask Oyster River taxpayers to approve a bond up to $1.5 million over a 10 year period to fund the cost for an athletic facility upgrade project, the high school. And then starting where it says this project, I would fix that by saying this project will include an all-weather track, an artificial turf playing field and env with environmentally friendly fill, and a reconfigured baseball and softball fields. The benefits of the project include increasing safety, improving drainage, and reduced runoff into Beards Creek, and increasing field access, reducing the need to rent UNH fields. So it would co cobble out, take everything from this project down to uh, assuming, cut that out. You don't, the only thing you'd keep would be the estimated total cost of the project is 2.2 million. Does that make sense? And just say the reason why you did that because it's, because it's it's it, all over the place. It's like if it you, what you really want. It, if you have you're coming back to what. What you're really trying to say is you're trying to break this into two things, why you're doing the project right. yeah. and then how much does it cost and right. how you're paying yes. for it. Okay. And we've yes. managed to like mix that all yep. apart. So let's take the first part and say why we're doing the project, then take the second part and say, again, it's a $2.2 .2 million project and this is how we're going to pay for it. The, yeah, the first part defines the project. Yes. That's what it is. Yeah. Right. And it's, but we have it all over the place. So let's yep. just cut so out. for Laurie and I. Can you just read it into the record? Okay, so I'll read the whole thing. I would yep. say, uh, ask Oyster River taxpayers to approve a bond up to $1.5 million over a 10-year period to fund the cost for an athletic facilities upgrade project at the high school. This project will include an all-weather track, an artificial turf playing field with environmentally friendly fill, and reconfigured baseball and softball fields. The benefits of the project include increased safety, improved drainage, and reduced runoff into Beards Creek, and increased field access, reducing the need to rent UNH fields. Uh, the estimated total cost of the project is $2.2 .2 million. Um, assuming the $1.5 million uh, bond is approved by voters, $300,000 for the project will be uh, pre has been previously fundraised will be used to fund the construction of the all-weather track. The remaining 400000 will come from the fund balance. And then the last sentence, I can't remember what changes you made to it. So you can give that copy to I think that's a yeah. clear improvement. That, I mean, that brings the mm -hmm. parts yeah. Yeah, I like together. That. So thank you for doing that, Al. Yeah. Um, Al, would you slip the environmentally friendly fill to that later part? You could. No. You could. I kind of wrestled with that. I was like, I, I figured the only reason I put it there is once you're saying that you're doing the, the turf, the turf, you might as well just say it's environmentally friendly. And maybe we want to this. Yeah, and because okay. that's the first thing I was trying to catch. Great. Yeah. Is everybody? I know it's a lot. It's a lot to change, but it seems <laughs> to me I've heard it twice. I think it's it, it's a, it's an improvement in my view, because mm -hmm. um, I think it, it coheres more as a as a statement than than what was. Are there other? He asks with, asks with trepidation, are there any other <laughs> <laughs> changes? I think both those are, are, are clearly improvements. Uh, hearing, hearing none, are we ready to vote to approve the uh, description, the explanation for Article 3? Uh, Kenny? I move that we ex ex I move that <coughs> accept the explanation part of Warren Article 3 as we've amended or changed here. 
Moved by Kenny, seconded by Denise. Ready? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Seven in favor, the student rep in favor, the provision is, um, the explanation is approved. There's no explanation for four. That'll be pretty straightforward. Uh, for five, are there changes in the explanation for five? Would it, I mean, it's very small, but in that last sentence, the Facilities Developmental Capital Reserve Fund established in March 1999 and amended in March 2014 to a point. So just take out the was and add amended, end amended, the amended sentence. Wait, that's not that's not right. That isn't that doesn't that go that that goes that it doesn't that last sentence go with the next article? Because it's about the facilities development capital reserve fund? No, but the it's because the money from the orchard sale oh, is gonna go gonna into go that in. fund, oh, so we gotta oh. designate where it's going. Oh that I don't think that's clear. That okay. right. He's clearly need to come after fund and a come after something, yeah. Nineteen ninety nine. Right. But Wait a minute, yeah. And that was the other thing. That, that's confusing. Oh, wait a second. Okay. Right. Well, not for the man. So it reads now with those comments, the Facility Development Capital Reserve Fund established in March 1999 was amended in March 2014 to appoint the board as agents of this fund. That's fairly clear, I think. Yeah. To put the comma in after that works, after 1999. Okay. Yep. Just to so, put the comma so, in. But I, do you need a comma if you change was to and? That was your first suggestion. Then yeah. you don't need a you need a yeah. verb somewhere. I I think we should just leave that sentence out because I feel like it's pretty clear now that I go back and reading it in the article because all of a sudden I was thrown off because we're talking about facilities development in the next article. So I think because it says it right in the warrant, you know, in Article Five. Yeah. It says that facilities development capital reserve fund established in March 1999 and amended in March 2014. I, my sense is I don't think you need that last sentence in the explanation. I think, again, I think it just confuses. It confused me. I feel like if it confuses me, it's probably going to confuse some other voter yeah, it, out it there. Just, <laughs> it, just, it just essentially repeats what was. Yes, yeah. So, so is it important, though, to have that last part to appoint the school board as agents of this fund? This is just the explanation, okay. Ken, the, the body of the warrant. Is. I mean, I, I think what's missing you know, on this is, is uh, okay, so you said that the parcels aren't suitable. It, what's missing is so then what are you going to? We're going to use this money for something else, you know. I think that's what's the missing thing. I mean, it, and I, I I could live without. I mean, I, I agree with Denise. Just cut the last sentence off. But you may want to say something like uh, uh, the these funds would be used to meet whatever un you know unfulfilled capital improvement projects or something. Because you know, we really haven't said what we're going to use the money for. I, so would you say, so I have that sentence, as a result of our environmental study, the school board has determined these parcels are not suitable for any school purpose, and by placing that money in the facilities developmental capital reserve fund, it allows money to be spent for on capital projects. On capital projects. That's good. Could you could you say could you do that one more time? So we'll, we'll keep that sentence as a result of our environmental study. The school board has determined that these parcels are not suitable for any school purpose, and by placing this money in the facilities developmental capital reserve fund, it allows the district to meet um, capital needs, capital unmet capital needs. I wouldn't put the and, I would just keep the period after um, for any school purpose period and then just start the next sentence by placing this money. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So, we'll get rid of the and. 
Yeah, get put. Yeah, right. Get rid of the and. Yeah. Yep. Do you have all of that, Lauren? Could you maybe read, Lori? Okay. When when you have it, why don't you just read it to us, okay? If you start, as a, we could just start with as a result of our environmental study, just start reading it from that point. Do you have that, Lori? Do you have what Kenny was reading? I have the sentence that he's adding in. I don't know what he's adding in. He's adding in it at the end. It's, there's a sentence oh. already in that started with oh. as the sentence before it, as a result of our environmental study. Then that last sentence would be eliminated. So we we would be putting this instead of that yeah. last sentence. So we're getting rid of the last sentence completely, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and adding in by placing this money in the facilities capital reserve fund. It allows the district to meet capital needs. Mm -hmm. That's right. Is that correct? Okay. Yeah, Sounded right. Okay. So you have that language for. Okay. Minutes. All right. Are there any other changes? I think that it's a clear improvement because it kind of says what we're doing, why we need it. Yeah. So, um, um, other changes? Okay. Kenny? So I move that we accept um, the explanation for Article 5 as amended here at our meeting. Okay. Second? Seconded by Denise. Okay. Uh, we're here to vote on it. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Seven in favor, the student rep in favor. Okay, um, last one, uh, the description of Article 6. Um. I have something on that as well. Uh, go ahead, Kenny. Um, what troubled me a little bit, um, one, two, three, on the fourth line, and there's a sentence that starts with this fund. Mm -hmm. And in the explanation, we've not yet defined this fund, but in the line before we mentioned funds. So I thought for clarity that instead of saying this fund, that we should name the fund, the, the Facilities Development Capital Reserve Fund, and then put, we'll assist in addressing these needs and other facility needs that may develop. And then should there be then continue as it is, and and then in that last fa facility development capital reserve fund, line. you can just say this fund. So yeah. it's kind of just reversing those, so we, people know what we're talking about. It it refers to it in article in the body of Article Six, but I think it's good to have the explanation really clear too. I just have such. I mean, this thing doesn't feel coherent to me. <laughs> I, I hate to say, because it, it it's almost starts with like, like almost the description of what budgets are, you know, are as, as um, you could just start, I mean, kind of get to the point and say that the, that ORCSD still has over $2.5 million in unmet facilities needs. Uh, the, uh, Facilities Development Capital Reserve Trust Fund, that's a mouthful, would assist in addressing these needs and other facilities uh, needs that may develop. And then you could continue on. Should there be any uh, remaining funds, Article 6 will allow 500,000 of the remaining funds to be placed in this fund. So you could just cut off those that whole first chunk. Yeah. That's what, I think that's what it is. Well, yeah, but it, then you're not saying where the funds are. So you would say, should there be any, you'd still have to say something about, should there be any remaining, what is it in the, what does it say on the, the undesignated sentence. fund balance? You know, you could you repeat that. You could repeat that same language as in the article. Because mm -hmm. otherwise you don't know where these remaining funds are coming from. So somehow you have to, you know, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So. If so you, you want to repeat, the should there be sentence. any 
uh, unless you say, should there be any year end, well, then you're just, I don't know, repeating what you just said in the. Okay, so then you could say, or still has 2.5 million unmet facilities uh, fund. Uh, this fund, you could still go and it says, we, where it says, uh, the, should there be any remaining funds, I guess you could change that to, uh, if there are unexpended funds at the end of the year, Article 6 allows up to 500,000 of these remaining funds to be placed in the, in the whatever that fund, does that, does that cover it? I worry about ordering it that way because I think you're running into what Maria is talking about with her concern of raise and appropriate, which I think we all, because we've sat through a lot of these meetings, understand that that means we are not asking for more taxpayer money. Mm -hmm. But I think if you, if you have the raise and appropriate and you start in with Oyster River has two and a half million needs, you know, dollars worth of facilities needs that need to be met, the taxpayer is going to stop there and go, and they want to raise and appropriate more money, no. So I think it, it would be a better idea to start out. I mean, that's, Tom, I agree. I didn't like the fact that it started with annual budgets. I felt like Jim was starting to tell me a story that I didn't necessarily <laughs> want to hear. Um, <laughs> but, but at the same rate, I was able to, I mean, it, it did, once I pushed through that initial feeling, it, it showed me that we weren't actually raising and appropriating more funds, but that there was leftover money at the <laughs> <laughs> that do unused Except we money. say it. <laughs> <laughs> there was unused money. So I sort of like it better this way than jumping into saying that we have the un. Can I take needs. a crack at it? Sure. So how about just this? Due to unanticipated revenues and unexpected, unexpended accounts, there may be unspent funds remaining at the end of the fiscal year. ORCSD still has over 2.5 million in unmet facilities needs. Then I would say, name that long name <laughs> fund, will assist in addressing these needs and other facility needs that may develop. So we might say addressing these and other facility needs. I don't think we need needs. Mm -hmm. um, so should there be any year end designated undesignated fund balance, Article 6 allows up to $500,000 of these remaining funds to be placed in the FDC RF. Because so I, oh. I, 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 it kind of, I'm looking, we, we want to be able to explain where the money came from. It's coming from money that was not spent, and that's what those first two lines are. So I thought trying to incorporate it with that due to, and then specifically saying where the money would go, and then explaining that there's a ceiling on it. We're not gonna put all that money in. We're only gonna take 500,000. Uh, could you just read it one more time for me? It's, it's a little <laughs> hard to. I'll try. <laughs> okay, ready, Lori? Uh, Okay. I'll try. This is, this is riveting television, okay. I'm sure, for viewers. So, due to, the sentence starts, due to unanticipated revenues and unexpected, unexpended accounts, there may be unspent funds remaining at the end of the fiscal year. We could even say recognizing that ORCSD still has over 2.5 million in unmet facilities fees. Mm -hmm. the, and then the FDCRF will assist in addressing these needs, these and other facility needs that may develop. Should there be any year and undesignated fund balance, Article 6 allows up to 500,000 of the remaining funds to be placed in that facility. Facilities Development Capital Reserve Fund. We could end it there. Or we could also say anything above five hundred thousand will be returned to the voters. Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't go there. No. Can I? Yeah, I think another crack at this too. <laughs> so. what, 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 what's wrong with that? I mean, I think that works for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was just saying, I have one alternative, and you can. I, can I? Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I just want like students who are out there and saying that you know they rewrite their paper. We're kind of modeling that behavior. That's right. 
But mine, I, why not just take and move, say, start with what we're really trying to do, just say, Article 6 allows up to $500,000 of the unexpended year-end trust, uh, unexpended year-end balance to be placed in the facility development capital reserve fund. ORCSD still has over $2.5 million in unmet facility uh, needs. This fund will assist in addressing these needs and other facility uh, needs that may be developed. I like that one better. <laughs> it's like shifting it. Yeah. Shift it why we're doing it. Shifting it again, yeah. Read it one more time. Okay. Yeah. Um, I've got one option. <laughs> okay. Let us like. agree on one first. Okay. Yeah. I'll do it one more time. Yeah. And again, I'm sorry. Uh, all right. Article 6 allows up to $500,000 of the uh, remaining uh, year-end fund balance to be placed in the Facility Development Capital Reserve Trust Fund. ORCS, uh, ORCSD still has over $2.5 million in unmet facilities needs. This fund will assist in addressing these needs and other facility, it, the, uh, the, will assist in addressing these needs and other facility needs that may develop. Does that, does that work? Yeah, just feet. capture all of that. <laughs> An observation. Dad, 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 the I forgot the record. Dad, dad. Oh yeah, I, like, I did like the recognizing. Yeah. So, so let's make sure we keep the recognizing. The recognizing, recognizing. So the recognizing, yeah. recognizing <laughs> so keep your first sentence, and then put recognizing that ORC SD still has over 2.5 million in unmet facilities needs, comma, and then put this, the, blah, 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 Oh, beep, beep, so, bop, 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 we can, can do I, that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So one of the things I think we set out to address was that we're not raising funds, okay? I feel as though Kenny's rewriting does a better job of right at the outset explaining how this money comes to be. <laughs> Whereas, although I think maybe more concise, Al's doesn't really make that point to the layperson. Okay, so I'm gonna be concise and address the need. <laughs> okay. All right, due to the unanticipated revenues and unexpended accounts, there may be funds remaining at the end of the year. Article six allows up to 500,000 of the remaining funds to be placed in the facilities development capital reserve fund to address or to help address the over 2.5 million unmet facilities needs in yeah, North. I like that. That's yes. perfect. There you go. Okay, read it one more time. And I can't do it again. <laughs> no, you have to. Oh, come on, you write it We're down. just listening in the first round. <laughs> come on. Um, no, so, I have, I definitely the, so I said, do, so I just took the first two sentences out. Yeah. yeah. And I, so due to unanticipated revenues and unexpected accounts, there may be funds remaining at the end of the year. Article six allows up to 500,000 of the remaining funds to be placed in the Facilities Development Capital Reserve Fund to help address ORC, or the over 2.5 million in unmet ORCS, ORCSD needs. QPT. <laughs> yeah. I think you got a winner. So okay. that last one, the last. Is that okay? Part yeah, sounds good to me. Off. I like yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. Because I got the first <laughs> So, Laura, you got this one? She's going to write it down. I'm going to write it down. Okay. I'm going to do an interpretive dance. That's right. Does everybody have a sense of Sarah's revision, which I think <laughs> does the job? Are we okay? Okay. Uh, so, uh, could we have, I'm sorry, I'm, start, I'm lost track of where we are with motions. Sarah's going to make a motion, and then somebody's going to second no it. There is no motion? <laughs> okay. Then maybe, Sarah, you can make a motion, read it, and then um, okay. we'll vote on it, okay? All right. Well, then let me just, I'll just number it the way that I said it, because I really just use. This is just like an English department. Oh, that's, yeah. that's, I'm never gonna <laughs> that's a compliment or not, but. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad all of our business doesn't uh, transpire this way. <laughs> article six to address. All right, so you want me to make a motion that we change the article to this? Is yeah, that yeah, yeah. Okay, so I make a motion that we uh, change article six, six explanation to read. 
Due to unanticipated revenues and unexpected accounts, <coughs> there may be funds remaining at the end of the year. Article 6 allows up to 500,000 of the remaining funds to be placed in the Facilities Development Capital Reserve Fund to address over 2.5 million in unmet facility needs. So there's a motion by Sarah, seconded by Al. I'm sorry. Are we ready to vote? Okay. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Seven in favor, the student rep in favor. Okay, let's take a five minute break. Good work. Uh, what do we have left? <laughs> what? We are almost done. I think. Yeah, yeah. We have the calendar. It's not that big. So that's good. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, it won't be. Okay, um, I'd like to just to propose that we, um, there's actually two non-public issues, one that'll be very brief. And I'm thinking, um, although I'd be certainly overruled if you folks think differently, that since it's so late now that we would postpone, we, we do not need to finish the superintendent's evaluation, we could postpone that till the next meeting. Denise? I, I would suggest that perhaps just um, doing a quick meeting to perhaps just distribute the, the draft for review or something like that. I don't know. Okay. Okay. Without, you know, getting into. We don't have to wordsmith tonight, please. Yeah, so or not even just, just so folks can. Mm -hmm. kind of can we take them home, the drafts? I think we don't need to go into non public for that, I don't do we? I think so. Hmm. I'm sorry. Do, do we need to go into non-public just to distribute drafts? Oh. No, I mean you're not going to talk about them. You can. We're not going to have a discussion. Yeah, you guys can pass them out here. Just, um, just be very careful. It is a personnel document. Whether it's mine or somebody <laughs> else's is a material. Mm -hmm. Normally, we wouldn't want um, documents like that floating around. Okay. So. I don't didn't think we did distribute drafts to take. Out of the meeting, fine. so. Mm -hmm. um, did I? Did, is that what you what's intended? What's the timeline? Denise, or? <coughs> um, is the timeline that we have tried to adhere to as a body, which we've been successful mostly, is to try to make sure the board that's evaluating me is the board that's in, uh, is, is currently in place. In other words, try not to shift into the March board meeting because there's a person or potentially a person or persons who have no um, knowledge of, of my work. Okay. I, it, I think it would make wonderful sense for us to have a draft and come to the next meeting really prepared to right away dig into it, I think, rather than okay. going to a meeting and then having to read the draft and then reacting then it gives us time to think and so if we all are good stewards of it I think that's the ideal situation. Okay. Mm -hmm. I disagree. Um, Alex, go ahead. I, I was just saying we, timeline wise we have two meetings in January and you already have a rough draft done so in theory the first meeting in January, you can get all the comment. We can, at worst, read the rough draft at the whatever January, first meeting in January, give you all of our comments, and you could come back the second meeting in January with all the revised stuff. And it would still put us on target at the beginning of February to give it to Jim. So I, I don't, I mean, it's I totally doable. I think, I think, that, I think that's, that's doable to me. And I think it's just too, it's too late to be doing any substantive work on something that important. That's my view. <clears throat> and as I remember the draft agenda that Tom and Al and I worked on, it, it seems very doable that it would be fitting in nicely to that agenda. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, so we have the, I think we're down to the approval of the school calendar. So uh, just in terms quickly of the calendar, this calendar has been reviewed by a calendar committee of the staff. It's also been heavily uh, aligned with Dover, Summersworth, 
um, Barrington, uh, those are the school districts that we do the most work with. The reason we want to make sure that it's aligned to Dover and Summersworth is because of um, our Vogue school kids. And then finally, I would add that we do have a day, unique day, the presidential election um, next year uh, is unique to us as a staff development day because we use the high school as a voting uh, location. And it's critical that we do not have students in school during a presidential election, not because they wouldn't be great, but because if you ever have been here during a presidential election, you literally have lines of people throughout this first floor. Uh, it, it, I remember the first one I saw here during the Obama election, and there was no room to breathe. So not having kids in session is critically important for the high school, and have that be a staff adult, it makes perfect sense. So those are the big, big issues. It's been heavily vetted. Sir? Uh, having heard that solves a lot of my questions. What happened to the 180 day school year that was so typical? Like what, we're at 178, I'm assuming that's fine and we meet all regs, yeah. but. Yeah, um, two years ago uh, we proposed to the board that we go from, uh, away from the day count into the hour count. And counting hours, this exceeds the state mandates um, on the number of hours students are in session. Thank you. Yeah, um, relatively minor point, but something that's come up with a number of families. Um, January, you have um, a holiday Monday off followed by a teacher workshop Monday off. Um, several families have mentioned to me why don't we align the teacher workshop to extend the already long weekend with a holiday? Mm -hmm. Um, I just thought it might be worth discussing that in sure. the public forum. Um, we, as I said initially, it's, it's not so much about aligning holidays, it's aligning, aligning school days. And the school days that we're trying to align to are the vocational schools in Dover and Summersworth. So there's a very real reason we do it that way. If the other school systems are going down that path, we don't want to be the outlier because our kids who participate in the vote programs get left out. And so we try to make sure the students' needs are addressed in this calendar. So it's, it's students driving the need and then the, and the parent, uh, the teachers come in and say, you know, can you adjust this, can you adjust that, as long as we're staying true to the vocational calendars. And again, the one place we're not is the presidential election. But other than that, this calendar is tightly aligned with Dover and Summersworth. Okay. Could I have a motion to approve the calendar? Oh. I'd like to make a, a motion to approve the 2016-2017 school year calendar as presented. Moved by Denise. Is there a second? Seconded by Kenny. Okay. Um, further discussion, questions? Maria? If the presidential election puts this kind of pressure on, maybe it's time to ask the Durham Town Council that we have two polling places in town. Um, we could do that, but I, I think that, I mean, Todd and I have talked about this. We think this is an incredible educational opportunity for our students as, as well. So, um, you know, if the board is feeling uncomfortable about using the high school, we certainly could approach them. But Todd and I have this conversation, and we, we feel it's a, a real great opportunity for our teenagers. Kenny? And, and just to answer that, and it has nothing to do with my time on the town council, but there was a year that... Um, Durham's voting took place at the Goss plant, and people were very unhappy because it was really so far to the periphery of town. And then another year it happened in a church, and people were really unhappy about going to the church to vote. And Durham doesn't have any other facility that would accommodate the crowd. So those were, those were you know, churches and Goss were the only ones, and people were very upset about voting. I know. But I was asking for two, one here that wouldn't be so crowded, another one at UNH, which would accommodate the students that uh, historically has had a hard time getting here to vote. Mm -hmm. Of course, that's part of my UNH would have vote. a huge parking issue, I think. <laughs> Anything? <laughs> uh. in, in, uh, and just to be you know, totally transparent, um, we also have had at least one person come forward concerned about um, school safety 
and Todd and I met with Chief Kurtz, and he makes sure that the building's well covered during elections, even non-presidential elections. So, um, right, I just add sure. I, I did talk with um, Chris Regan, the, the town moderator. He, he, he and I talk about this on a regular basis. This upcoming election, because you have, um, it's, it's, a, it's an open election, they're anticipating voter turnout in Durham to be around 5,000 voters, um, which is more than three times what it typically is in a normal election. Um, so in, generally on presidential election years, that's what happens in Durham is the voter turnout is significantly higher. So typically every four years it becomes a really big deal. Um, uh, and you have, I mean, UNH is running buses over here and, and so forth. So I think, you know, to your point, Maria, I do think that maybe in general looking at more locations might solve the problem, but I think in a presidential year, even cutting it in half, you're still going to talk 2,500 to 3,000 people coming here, and it just isn't compatible with a school day um, either way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there further discussion with you, Sarah? Um, I just want to throw this in there. It's not for discussion tonight, but um, Dr. Morris, at some point we had talked about a conversation about blizzard bags. We're not having that issue this year <laughs> yet, and <laughs> we may. Um, but I know there have been, I've been approached by a number of people in the community about blizzard bags, and you had talked at one point about possibly bringing it to the staff and then bringing us back what their feedback is. Will do. Thank you. Good. So are we ready to vote on the calendar? All those in favor, please raise your hands. Seven in favor. The calendar is approved. Uh, nomination for Oyster, Oyster River Middle School activity nominations. Kenny? Uh, I move that we accept the nominations as put forward by Principal Jay Richard, John Silveria for Robotics, John Silveria, Grade 8 Student Council, Joe Boucher, Grade 5 Leadership, and Jason Duff, Grade 7 Student Council. Moved by Kenny, is there a second? Seconded by Denise. Is there discussion on this? <coughs> Hearing none, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Seven in favor. These nominations are approved. Um, so we have uh, two policy things. To, is it two, right? Actually three. Three, okay. One, I'll make a motion. Okay, Denise? Um, well, I'd like to make a motion for policy JLCF, student wellness um, for first read. Okay, moved by Denise, is there a second? Seconded by Dan, okay, well, I'm sorry, yeah. You. <laughs> and just explanation there, it needs to be. Really the only thing that's changed is the line under rewards, uh. where it says food and beverages <coughs> are not allowed as rewards, and that replaces that language prohibited, and then takes out, and this is to conform with a grant that we um, have applied for and received, and specifically that language was required. Okay. Moved by, did, I'm sorry, did you? I'm, I'm losing track. Denise. It was Denise. Moved and Dan. Dan. Okay, yeah, okay, it's just late. Uh, is there further discussion of this policy? I just have a question, actually. So it's like you guys have it as a first and a second read all in one meeting, which you can only do by policy via like an emergency. So what's the emergency? The grant? It's not, it's a grant, but also the policy committee felt that it was such a oh, yeah. non-substantial change that it's not a policy change, just a wording change. So, Before uh, you couldn't do it, now it's prohibited or vice versa. It's not allowed in Senate. No, it's not. Before it was prohibited, though it's not allowed. So mm -hmm. just to uh, conform with. It's literally the, changing two words. That yeah, means the same and thing. I, I understand that, so, but again, it's like the policy uh, is that it has, if you're going to suspend the two week period, you it's supposed to be for like an emergency, per, it's an emergency waiver. And even though it is, if it is a small and somewhat, you know, uh, you know, in contra you know, I mean, smaller change, unless it absolutely has to be done before, I don't like setting the precedent that you set aside the policy of that time period. So I, I just, you know, I, I, I question if it's not, can it wait two weeks? Is it, would you lose the grant if you didn't do it in two weeks? No. Probably not. I 
mean, it you just know, seems like a bigger uh, it's just, process, and it needs to be for semantics. <laughs> well, I think. I, so, I mean, I think a lot of the changes we do are that way. So if we start going down that direction, there's a lot of policies that are just minorly, but they still go through the two. I, I think okay. there would be an emergency if, if there's any any danger of they're losing the grant. I don't know that there is. I mean, we've been talking about this, and nobody's given me a deadline that says if this doesn't happen by tomorrow. Um, so I don't know that that exists, that emergency exists. Okay. Then my ruling would be that we vote on it for the first read, and you can overrule that if you think that's inappropriate. But you know, I, I don't think. That, otherwise, I think we're starting down a trend where if we do a minor thing, we don't we, we don't do the first and second read. So, uh, so if, is the motion to approve it as first read? Yep. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I, I think so. Uh, is there further discussion on this for the first read? All those in favor, please raise your hand. It's approved for first read. Um, could you have a motion for the uh, second read then? I'll do, a, I'll do a motion. Okay. I'll make a motion. Sure. To for JF policy JFAB admission of tu tuition and non resident students for a second read. Moved by Denise, seconded by Sarah. <laughs> Um, is there discussion on this? Seems like this gives more authority to the, to you. You don't have to, you know, which I think is fine. Is that the sense? Um, the way that I read this is it actually shifts shifts responsibility from me to the board. So it's the exact opposite. Current under current, up until June of this year. The decision was strictly administrative. Now it's turned into a situation where I'm making a recommendation based on the recommendation of another school board and another superintendent. If we're all in agreement, then the child could come in. Um, but uh, it starts at the host school and no longer stays in my office, has to go to you first. And then, uh -huh. so it's a, it's a much more convoluted process. Is this, is this because it needs to be by some? law change that um, takes the ch decision out of the superintendent's office and brings it to the board. Okay. Okay. So we're ready to vote on this for second read? Okay. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Seven in favor, the student, I'm sorry, the student ref's not here. Let's <coughs> just have it, okay. Um, okay, uh, school committee updates. Maria? Uh, the date for the New Hampshire School Board Association meeting has been changed and changed to a day that I have opera tickets. So if anybody What is else, the date, what is the date? Uh, January 16th. Yeah. Okay. Is there anybody who would like to go? Either to the opera or to the <laughs> delegate <laughs> assembly? <laughs> <laughs> what opera is it? Uh, yeah. I that's forget. <laughs> so that's a Saturday, right? Yeah. Okay. I can and it's go. in Concord? Concord, yes. From 9.45 to 2.30. Al went last year, didn't you have fun? I went last year. Wouldn't you like to do it again? Not particularly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, shucks. And I'll be out of town. So. No, thanks. Yes. I'll be out of town. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and okay. having comfort. Uh, we'll, 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 I can't say it this time. We'll see. Okay. okay. Thank you. Are there other committee updates? Hearing none. Okay. Um, public comment? Oh, we all do. <laughs> yeah. Okay, here. Good evening. Jennifer Lyon, a parent of five in the district. Um, I was wanted to comment about the later start times. I apologize, I didn't get here earlier, but I walked in as you had your follow-up questions from the presentation. Um, I have to admit, I was a little dismayed because I felt like some of the questions had been addressed earlier last school year when we were here talking about this. Um, I think that the, re the evidence and the research has shown that students do better if they get more sleep and that when school start S schools start later, 
students get more sleep. Even if they say on a survey, oh, I'll just stay up later. They really do get more sleep. It's studied, it's shown. Um, as we take this to the community, which I hope we will do sooner than later, you're gonna hear lots of anecdotes about children's needs and you know, individual stories. Um, I have five children and I can't tell you how this is gonna affect each one of them, but overall, the, the districts that take this on realize that their goal is to meet uh, the needs of most students most of the time. There might be exceptions for a certain time of the year or you know, outliers that are never going to benefit from this, but most of the students, most of the time, do better with more sleep. And students that start later get more sleep. Um, I really wanted to thank Dr. Morse and um, his committee for just really vetting these options and working with um, the resources we have to um, keep costs down <laughs> and um, think of things that would be very feasible in our um, district. The other key was that districts that had success making this change gave parents time to adjust to it. Um, just as with the full day kindergarten, it's important to have the forum early so that they can prepare for the fall. It's the same with start time. So the um, earlier you can uh, inform the public of the options and give them the chance to um, let you know their feelings. Um, I encourage you to work with Dr. Morse and his um, leadership on this to uh, get to the community sooner than later. I thank you for your time and your work and I look forward to seeing where we go from here. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Dee dunbar Hambuchen, and I have one child who's a freshman this year, and I wouldn't have stayed so late if this were not really important to my family. Um, one of the things that we found in the research is that only 5% of the population is really um, functional in the morning. And so that means 95% of our kids are really not getting the most out of their courses. And we know that the teachers in this district really are wonderful, but if the kids aren't awake, they're really not getting the most out of those courses. And um, I know that my daughter is not a morning person. She never has, not even in, in elementary school. But I worry about maybe her not getting, uh, not being inspired in certain subjects, not because the teachers are not capable or willing, but just because she's not awake. Um, another thing is, when we look at it as a wellness piece, I'd be curious to find out how many of the kids come highly caffeinated in the morning just to function. Um, and in essence, that's, they're drugging themselves to function in the morning. So that's something I don't know if, um, if that question has been asked. And also, if you know, a huge portion of what was presented this evening f um, was around sports, and if kids are better rested, they're going to be doing better not just ac at academics, but at their sports as well. So maybe they won't need as long of a, a, of a practice time. I don't know, I'm not a, an athletic trainer, but being well rested will help them in everything. So anyway, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Hi, Kate McManus. I have six kids in the district. So I just wanted to point out a couple of things. They talked about the flexible different schedules at the high school. That doesn't really help the middle school level. But, um, but when we talked about it as parents, there was bus scheduling problems um, and things like that that fell into that piece that really kind of made it hard. So if you do a flexible schedule, who gets to come? The later kids, the early kids, who misses out and how does that really benefit or hurt, you know, the students? So, and then I came from a district in California where I was there for nine years and I was PTA president and I worked really hard on changing the district and we actually approved and it's not an easy task to take this on and say we're going to change your lives like it or not and there were many people because it was a small district we didn't have buses though so it was kind of california really cramped in and it was um one of those things that was hard and nobody liked it the parents didn't like it the students said they didn't like happening to stay later at school they wanted to get out earlier um but in the end the wellness committee took it on and they they did the first year they changed it for 15 minutes and everybody adapted and then the second year they changed it an additional 15 minutes and so that's kind of ripping the band-aid off slowly mm -hmm. but if that's what it takes that's what it takes and that's what they did and they found that all of the childcare issues adapted all of the sports issues adapted they had football and all sorts of things there too um it all 
ends up working out. And although that's easy to say and not easy to tell a parent who's worried about childcare and things like that, it does eventually all work its way out. And I think that that's an important thing to help people figure that out. But I just wanted to say those pieces. And with the student who said, I'll probably just stay up later, um, the research from, I talked with people and we've had talks from people from Stanford that study this and professors and sleep specialists and they said, you know, what happens is no matter how hard you take away the cell phones, take away the TV, because I do those, I have six kids and some it works and some it's much harder, but um, no matter how hard you try to duct tape that kid to the bed, they're not going to sleep, not because they're bad kids, but because their sleep schedules just change. And it's true, there's like this bell curve when they become adolescents. And not all the kids fit into that same bell curve, but the majority of kids do. And I feel like as a district, our responsibility is to look out for the majority of the students and to have their best well-being in our minds and to try to do the best we can for the majority. And that's what I always did as a PTA president, and that's what I try to do as a mom with multiple kids. And um, I think that that's a really important thing to understand, that although they say they're going to, the majority of them are staying up no matter what, and they're going to fall asleep when they're tired. So anyways, I just wanted to let you know, and I really appreciate everything you guys do. So school birds work so hard, <laughs> and thank you for everything. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay. Um, closing actions, uh, future meetings. Uh, next meeting on the 6th of the new year. Um, and I think that given the late hour, I've talked to Dr. Morse, the two issues that we talked about the evaluation to put that off till the next meeting. And I think uh, the other was a, an informational piece that can also wait till the, till the next meeting. So. Um, I think that we are ready then to adjourn. It's almost 10 o'clock now, I don't think. I know, so. we adjourn. <laughs> Maria. Uh, Maria has moved to adjourn. Do we have, do we have a second? Sorry. We have a second from Sarah. Okay. All those in favor of adjourn, please raise your hand. Seven Happy birthday, Maria. Happy birthday, Maria. Oh, thank you. So I was